So we have already uh, read the prologue, and we've examined that prologue, where we already know what happens in the play, and that leads us to ask questions like, well, yes, we know that there are two twins who've died. How did they die? We know that one was given away at birth. Why was he given away at birth? And perhaps we'll get more information in this next part of the play. So the lights come up to show a reenactment of the final moments of the play, the deaths of Mickey and Edward. So we assume that Mickey and Edward are these twins and the scene fades. We've ended at the beginning. Mrs. Johnson enters with her back to the audience. Now think about why she might be doing that. Why is she turning her back to us? Is she ashamed? Is she faceless? Like she feels she has no face or voice. Um, so we could think about the details here. She says, and did you never hear of the mother so cruel? There's a stone in the place of her heart. Then bring her on and come judge for yourselves how she came to play this part. So the narrator has invited us here to judge her and decide for ourselves. She uh, is a mother so cruel, there's a stone in her heart. That's clearly what society thinks about her. She's a stone for her heart. She's got a metaphor there of a stony heart. But now we get the chance to judge her for ourselves. We're going to dive into um, her through the song she sings. So the narrator exits. Music is heard as Mrs. Johnson turns and walks towards us. So she's clearly kind of, if you think about the staging, she is now inviting us in. She's turned towards us and she's almost like confiding us as an audience member. She's age 30, but she looks more like 50. Just think about why that is. Why would someone look so old? What does that tell you about that character? What impressions do you get? Then Mrs. Johnson starts her singing. Again, I won't sing this. I'll just read it for you. Once I had a husband, you know, the sort of chap. I met him at a dance and how he came on with the chat. He said my eyes were deep blue pools, my skin as soft as snow. He told me I was sexier than Marilyn Monroe. So we start off with this immediately establishes a sense of excitement, maybe adventure and romance. We've got dancing, her eyes are deep blue pools. Again, it's quite a stereotypical thing to say, but it's a line that seems to have worked. Her skin's as soft as snow. Think about the the snow metaphor there or simile, soft as snow and what we associate with the color white, we associate with snow. And Marilyn Monroe will come back to her. And we went dancing, we went dancing. Then of course I found that I was six weeks overdue. We got married at the registry and then we had a do. We all had curly salmon sandwiches and how the ale did flow. They said the bride was lovelier than Marilyn Monroe. <clears throat> so they've got married at the registry and had a do. So had a bit of a party. Um, she obviously remembers this well, um, how everybody admired the way she looked. And we went dancing. Yes, we went dancing. So we get a bit of a turning point here now. Then the baby came along. We called him Darren Wayne. Then three months on, I found that I was in the club again. And though I still fancied dancing, my husband wouldn't go with a wife, he said, was twice the size of Marilyn Monroe. So now this is a turning point where obviously the husband's kind of changed now. He's less affectionate, doesn't want to take her dancing. No more dancing, no more dancing. By the time I was 25, I looked like 42 with seven hungry mouths to feed and one more nearly do. Me husband, he'd walked out on me a month or two ago for a girl, they say, who looks a bit like Marilyn Monroe. So we get that cycle there. He's obviously gone, uh, gone away with someone else who looks like the way she used to look like. So she feels rejected and they go dancing. They go dancing. Yes, they go dancing. They go. We end on that word go emphasizing that they've gone, that she's been left and isolated. So maybe we get a bit more of the background of her now. Maybe we understand her, not just as this cold hearted woman, but maybe we understand what's going on. So what I want you to do now is think back to the questions we asked at the start. What are your impressions of her? I want you to write in your workbook, her name, Mrs. Johnston, put a colon. I want you to write down four or five words to describe her character at this point in the play. So what are your initial impressions of her? Then I want you to write down audience reactions. Think about the emotions we are supposed to feel for her. Start right at the top, maybe with the narrator's uh, comment. And then as you go through, does that change? Do we have different ideas? So pause the recording, give yourselves four minutes to write down any initial impressions and audience reactions, and then we'll go through them together. 
Okay, so we should now have different uh, impressions we get of her. Think about what's said about her or what she says about her own experience. So I'm going to put one thing I'm going to put for impressions is I'm going to put naive. Uh, N-A-I-V-E. She doesn't seem to really understand the world. You know, when she has this chap she's with, um, she doesn't seem to understand what's going on. She just kind of gets wrapped up in what's going on. Um, and she accepts everything he says. So I would put naive. I'd put innocent as well. I'm thinking about that line, uh, her skin being like snow, white, purity, um, innocence. She seems very innocent, naive, um, you then got the fact that she's kind of a little bit, um, I might argue she's a bit shallow um, in the fact that she constantly talks about being like Marilyn Monroe. And we know if you know anything about her, about appearances, about looking a certain way, about being glamorous. So those are some of my impressions I'd have. In terms of what I'd write for audience reaction, I think sympathy is a big one, isn't it? We feel sorry for her. We look at her situation, her husband leaves her. She has seven children to look after. I'd say sympathy, um, but I might also put judgmental, particularly at the start, I might judge her a little bit, thinking, oh, she cares about is the way she looks. Um, obviously the narrator says she's got a heart of stone. So there's a couple of uh, audience reactions you could have had, but obviously there's others as well. And there's your personal reaction as well. How do you feel about her as you read on about her? And that's very important as we move on to the next part. Okay, so let's start reading the first part of this play uh, to, for today. So an irate milkman, irate meaning like frustrated, an irate milkman, the narrator, rushes in to rudely interrupt the song. Listen, love, I'm up to here with hard luck stories. You owe me three pounds, seventeen and fourpence, and either you pay up today, like now, or I'll be forced to cut off your deliveries. I said, I said, look, next week I'll pay you. Next week, next week, next week. Next week never arrives round here. I'd be a rich man if next week ever came. But look, look, I've started a job next week. I'll have money coming in and I'll be able to pay you. You can't stop the milk. I need the milk. I'm pregnant. Well, don't look at me, love. I might be a milkman, but it's got nothing to do with me. Now you've been told, no money, no milk. The milkman exits. Mrs. Johnston stands alone, and we hear some of her kids off. Kid one, off. Ma'am, ma'am, the baby's crying. He wants his bottle, where's the milk? Kid two, off. Hey, ma'am, how come I'm on free dinners? All the other kids are laughing at me. Kid three, off. Hey, mother, I'm starving and there's nothing in. They'll be never bloody well is. Mrs. Johnson, perfunctorily. Don't swear, I've told you. Kid four, off. Mum, I can't sleep, I'm hungry, I'm starving. Kids off, and me, ma'am, and me, and me. Mrs. Johnson singing. I'm not going to sing. I know it's hard on all you kids, but try and get some sleep. Next week I'll be earning. We'll have loads of things to eat. We'll have ham and jam and spam and... Speaking, roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, Battenberg cake. Chicken and chips, corned beef, sausages, treacle tart, mince and spuds, milkshake for the baby. There's a chorus of groaning ecstasy from the kids. Ooh. Mrs. Johnson picks up the tune again. When I bring home the dough, we'll live like kings, like bright young things, like Marilyn Monroe. And we'll go dancing. Mrs. Johnson hums a few bars of the song and dances a few steps as she makes her way to her place of work. Mrs. Lyon's house. During the dance, she acquires a brush, dusters, and a mop bucket. Mrs. Lyons's house is where Mrs. Johnson is working. Mrs. Lyons enters carrying a parcel. Hello, Mrs. Johnson, how are you? Is the job working out all right for you? It's um, great, thank you. It's such a lovely house. It's a pleasure to clean it. It's a pretty house, isn't it? It's a pity it's so big, I'm finding it rather large at present. Oh yeah, with Mr. Lyons being away in that. When does he come back, Mrs. Lyons? Oh, it seems like such a long time. The company sent him out there for nine months, so what's that? He'll be back in about five months time. Ah, you'll be glad when he's back, won't you? The house won't feel so empty then, will it? Mrs. Johnson begins to unwrap her parcel. Actually, Mrs. J, we bought such a large house for... We bought such a large house for 
for the children. We thought children would come along. Well, you might still be able to... No, I'm afraid. We've been trying for such a long time now. I wanted to adopt, but Mr. Lyons is... Well, he says he wants his own son, but not someone else's. Myself, I believe that an ado adopted child can become one's own. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I... It's weird, though, isn't it? Here's you, you can't have kids, and me, I can't stop having them. My husband used to say that all we had to do was shake hands, and I'd be in the club. You must have shook hands with me before you left. I'm having another one, you know. Oh, I see. Oh, but look, it's all right, Mrs Lyons. I'll still be able to do me work. Having babies, it's like clockwork to me. I'm back on my feet and working the next day, you know. If I had this one at the weekend, I wouldn't even be able to take one day off. I love this job, you know. We can manage to get by by now. She stopped by Mrs Lyons, putting the contents of the package, a pair of new shoes on the table. Jesus Christ, Mrs Lyons, what are you trying to do? My God, what's wrong? The shoes, the shoes. Pardon? New shoes on the table, take them off. Mrs Lyons does so, relieved. Oh God, Mrs Lyons, never put new shoes on a table. You'll never know what'll happen. Mrs Lyons twigging it, laughing. Oh, you mean you're superstitious? No, but you never put shoes, new shoes on the table. Oh, go on with you. Look, if it will make you any happier, I'll put them away. Mrs. Lyons exits with the shoes. Music is heard as Mrs. Johnson wearily approaches the table and the narrator enters. There's shoes upon the table and a joker in the pack. The salt's been spilt and a looking glass cracked. There's one lone magpie overhead. I'm not superstitious, the mother said. I'm not superstitious, the mother said. The narrator exits to re-enter as a gynaecologist. What are you doing here? The milk bill's not till Tuesday. Gynaecologist produces a listening funnel. Actually, I've given up milk round and gone to medicine. I'm your gynaecologist. He begins to examine her. Okay, mummy, let's have a little listen to the baby's ticker, shall we? I was dead worried about having another baby, you know, doctor. I didn't see how we were going to manage with another mouth to feed. But now I've got me a little job, we'll be okay. If I'm careful, we can just scrape by, even with another mouth to feed. The gynaecologist completes his examination. Mouths, mummy. What? Plural, Mrs. Johnson. Mouths to feed. You're expecting twins. Congratulations. And the next one, please, nurse. The gynaecologist exits. Mrs. Johnston, numbed by the news, moves back to her work, dusting the table upon which the shoes had been placed. Mrs. Lyons enters. Hello, Mrs. J. How are you? There's no reply. Registering the silence. Mrs. J. Anything wrong? I had it all worked out. What's the matter? We were just getting straight. Why don't you sit down? With one more baby we could have managed, but not with two. The welfare have already been on to me. They say I'm incapable of controlling the kids I've already got. They say I should put some of them into care. But I won't. I love the bones of every one of them. I love even those two when these come along. But like they, they say at the welfare, kids can't live on love alone. Twins? You're expecting twins? The narrator enters. How quickly an idea planted can take root and grow into a plan. The thought conceived in this very womb grew as surely as a seed in a mother's womb. The narrator exits. Mrs. Lyons almost inaudibly. Give one to me. What? Mrs. Lyons containing her excitement. Give one of them to me. One to you? Yes, yes. Mrs. Johnson taking it almost as a joke. But you can't just... When do you do? Um, well, about... Oh, but Mrs... Quickly, quickly, tell me, when are you due? July, he said, beginning of? July, and my husband doesn't get back until the middle of July. He need never guess. Amused, oh, it's mad. I know it is, it's mad, but it's wonderful, it's perfect. Look, look, you're what, four months pregnant, but you're only just beginning to show, so, so I'm four months pregnant, and I'm only just beginning to show. She grabs a cushion and arranges it beneath her dress. 
Look, look, I could have just got pregnant just before he went away, but I didn't tell him uh, in case I miscarried. I didn't want to worry him whilst he was away. But when he arrives home, I'll tell him we were wrong. The, the doctors were wrong. I have a baby, our baby. Mrs. Johnson, it'll work. It will, if only you'll... Oh, Mrs. Lyons, you can't be serious. You said yourself. You said you had too many children already. Yeah, but I don't know if I want to give one away. Okay, so if you remember in the last session, we read up to the point where Mrs. Lyons had just proposed her, her plan uh, where they were, uh, Mrs. Johnston was going to give one of her twins to Mrs. Lyons and they think they're going to get away with it. So, Mrs. Johnston. Yeah, but I don't know if I want to give one away. Already you're being threatened by the welfare people, Mrs. Johnson, with two more children. How can you possibly avoid some of them being put into care? Surely it's better to give one child to me. Look, at least if the child was with me, you'd be able to see him every day as you came to work. Mrs. Lyons stares at Mrs. Johnson, willing her to agree. Please, Mrs. Johnston, please. Are you, are you, are you that desperate to have a baby? Mrs. Lyons singing. Each day I look out from this window. I see him with his friends. I hear him call. I rush down, but as I fold my arms around him, he's gone. Was he ever there at all? I have dreamed of all the places I would take him, the games we'd play, the stories I would tell, the jokes we'd share, the clothing I would make him. I reach out, but as I do, he fades away. The melody shifts into that of Mr. Mrs. Johnson, who is looking at Mrs. Lyons, feeling for her. Mrs. Lyons gives a half smile and a shrug, perhaps slightly embarrassed at what she has revealed. Mrs. Johnston turns and looks at the room she's in, looking up in awe at the comparative opulence and ease of the place. Tentatively and wonderingly, wondering, she sings, If my child was raised in a palace like this one, he wouldn't have to worry where his next meal was coming from. His clothing would be supplied by George Henry Lee. Mrs. Lyons sees that Mrs. Johnson might be persuaded. Mrs. Lyons singing, He'd have all his own toys and a garden to play in. He could make too much noise without the neighbours complaining. Silver trays to take meals on. A bike with both wheels on? Mrs. Lyons nods enthusiastically. And he'd sleep every night in a bed of his own. He wouldn't get into fights. He'd leave matches alone. And you'd never find him effing and blinding. And when he grew up, he could never be told to stand and queue up for hours on end at the dole. He grew up to be, Mrs. Lyons, Mrs. Johnson together, a credit to me, to you. I would still be able to see him every day, wouldn't I? Of course, and, and you'd look after him, wouldn't you? I'd keep him warm in the winter and cool when it shines. I'd pull out his splinters without making him cry. I'd always be there if his dream was a nightmare. My child, my child. There is a pause before Mrs. Johnson nods. Mrs. Lyons goes across and kisses her, hugs her. Mrs. Johnson is slightly embarrassed. Oh, now you must help me. There's so much I'll have to do. She takes out the cushion. We'll do this properly so that it's thoroughly convincing and I'll need to see you walk and baby clothes. I'll, I'll have to knit and buy bottles and suffer from piles. What? Doesn't one get piles when one's pregnant and buy a cot and, oh, help me with this, Mrs. J. It, it is the right place. She puts the cushion back again. I wanted to look right before I go shopping. Mrs. Johnson helping her with the false pregnancy. What are you going for the shops for? I do the shopping. Oh no, from now on I do the shopping. I want everyone to know about my baby. She suddenly reaches for the Bible. Music. Mrs. J, we must make this uh, um, uh, binding agreement. Mrs. Lyons shows the Bible to Mrs. Johnson, who is at first reluctant, and then lays her hand on it. The narrator enters, a bass note repeated as a heartbeat. In the name of Jesus, the thing was done. Now there's no going back for anyone. It's too late now, for feeling torn. There's a pact been sealed. There's a deal been born. Mrs. Lyons puts the Bible away. Mrs. Johnson stands and stares as Mrs. Lyons grabs shopping bags and takes a last satisfied glance at herself in the mirror. Why, why did we have to do that? 
Mrs. J, nobody must ever know. Therefore, we need to have an agreement. Mrs. Johnson nods, but is still uncomfortable. Right, I shan't be long. Bye. Mrs. Lyons exits. Mrs. Johnson stands alone, afraid. The heartbeat grows in intensity. How swiftly those who've made a pact can come to overlook the fact or wish the reckoning to be delayed. But a debt is a debt and must be repaid. The narrator exits. As the heartbeat reaches maximum volume, it suddenly stops and is replaced by the sound of crying babies. Two nurses appear, each carrying a bundle. A pram is wheeled on. The nurses hand the bundles to Mrs. Johnson, who places them smiling into the pram, making faces and noises at the babies as she stops the crying. The babies settled, she sets off, wheeling the pram towards home. Various debt collectors emerge from her house to comfort Mrs. Johnston. Catalogue man. I'm sorry, love. The kids said you were at the hospital. He looks at the pram. Ah, oh, they're lovely, aren't they? I'm sorry, love, especially at a time like this, but you are twelve weeks behind your payments. I've got to do this, girl. A finance man. You shouldn't sign for the bloody stuff, missus. If you know what you can pay, you should bloody well sign. Catalogue man. Look, you could just give me a couple of... You could just give me a couple of weeks' money on this. I could leave it. Mrs. Johnson shakes her head. You shouldn't have signed for all this stuff, you, should you? You should know you wouldn't be able to pay, didn't you? Mrs. Johnson, almost to herself. When I got me job, I thought I'd be able to pay. When I went in the showroom, I only meant to come out with a couple of things. But when you're standing there, it all looks so nice. When you look in the catalogue and there's six months to pay, it seems years away and you need a few things, so you sign. Yeah, well, you bloody well shouldn't. Mrs. Johnson, coming out of her trance angrily. I know I shouldn't. You get so, you soft get. I've spent all my bleeding life knowing you shouldn't, but I do. Now take your sodden wireless and get off. Honest, love, I'm sorry. It's all right, lad. We're used to it. We were in the middle of our tea one night when they arrived for the table. She gives a wry laugh. Ah, well, as long as you can laugh about it, eh? That's the main thing, isn't it? The catalogue man exits. Mrs. Johnson not laughing. Yeah. Other creditors continue to enter the house and leave with goods. Mrs. Johnson watches the creditors. The babies begin to cry and she moves the pram, rocking it gently as she sings, as if to the babies in the pram, singing. Only mine till the time comes around to pay the bill. Then I'm afraid what can't be paid must be returned. You never ever learn that nothing's yours on easy terms, only for a time. I must not learn to call you mine, familiarise that face, those eyes, make future plans that can't be confirmed, on borrowed time, on easy terms, living on the never never, constant as the change in weather, never sure who's at the door, or the price I'll have to pay, should we meet again, I will not recognise your name, you can be sure what's gone before will be concealed, your friends will never learn that once we were on easy terms, Living on the never-never, constant as the change in weather, never sure who's at the door, or the price I'll have to pay. Mrs. Lyons enters still with the pregnancy padding. They're born. You didn't notify me. Well, I, I just, it's, I, I couldn't keep, couldn't I keep them for a few more days? Please, please, they're a pair, they go together. My husband's due back tomorrow, Mrs. Johnston. I must have my baby. We made an agreement, a bargain. You swore on the Bible. You'd better, you'd better see which one you want. I'll take, no, don't tell me which one, just take him, take him. Singing, living on the never-never, constant as the change in weather, never sure who's at the door or the price I'll have to pay, should we meet again. Mrs Lyons rapidly pulls out the padding from beneath her dress. Amongst it is a shawl which she uses to wrap around the baby before picking it up from the pram. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson, thank you. I'll see you next week. I'm due back tomorrow. I know, but why don't you... Why don't you take the week off? On full pay, of course. Mrs. Lyon en exits. Mrs. Johnson turns and enters her house with the remaining twin in the pram. Kid one, off. What happened to the other twin, mother? Kid two, off. Where's the other twinny, ma'am? Mrs. Johnson, he's gone. He's gone up to heaven, love. He's living with Jesus and the angels. Kid three off. 
What's it like up there, ma'am, in heaven? Mrs. Johnson, it's lovely, son. He'll be well looked after there. He'll have anything he wants. Will he have his own bike? Yeah, with both wheels on. Why can't we have a bike, eh? I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at the catalogue next week. We'll see what the bikes are like in there. Kids together. Ma'am, I want a Meccano set. You said I could have a new dress, mother. Why can't I have an air pistol? Let's look in the catalogue now, ma'am. It's great when we look at the catalogue, ma'am. Go on, let's have a, have a look in the catalogue. I've told you when I get home, I've got to go to work. Mr. and Mrs. Lyons enter their house and we see them looking at the child in its cot. Mrs. Johnson enters and immediately goes about her work. Mrs. Johnston stops for a mo stops work for a moment and glances into the cot, gleaming, gleaming and cooing. Mr. Lyons is next to her with Mrs. Lyons in the background, obviously agitated at Mrs. Johnson's fussing. Oh, come on now, isn't he, Mr. Lyons? I bet you. But you're dead proud of him, aren't you? Aren't you? Eh? Mr. Lyons, good-naturedly. Yes. Yes, I am, aren't I, Edward? I'm proud of Jennifer, too. Mr. Lyons beams at his wife, who can hardly raise a smile. Mrs. Johnston. Ah, he's lovely. She coos into the cot. Ah, look, he wants to be picked up. I'll just... No, no, Mrs. Johnston, he's fine. He doesn't want to be picked up. Ah, but look, he's going to cry. If he needs picking up, I shall pick him up, all right? Ah, well, I, I just thought... Sorry, I... Uh, yes, um, has the bathroom been done? Time is getting on. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Mrs. Johnston exits. Mr. Lyons. Darling, don't be hard on the woman. She only wanted to hold the baby. All women like to hold babies, don't they? I don't want her to hold the baby, Richard. She's... I don't want the baby to catch anything. Babies can catch things very easily, Richard. All right, all right, you know best. You don't see her as much as I do. She's always fussing over him, any opportunity, and she's cooing and cuddling as if she were his mother. She's always bothering him, Richard, always. Since the baby arrived, she ignores most of her work. She's about to cry. Come on, come on. It's, it's all right, Jennifer. You're just a little... It's this depression thing that happened after a woman's had a... I'm not depressed, Richard. It's just that she makes me feel... Richard, I think she should go. And what will you do for help in the house? I'll find somebody else. I'll, I'll find somebody who doesn't spend all day fussing over the baby. Mr. Lyons glancing at his watch. Oh, well, I suppose you know best. The house is your domain. Look, Jen, I've got a board meeting. I really must dash. Richard, can you let me have some cash? Of course. I need about fifty pounds. My God, what for? I've got lots of things to buy for the baby. I've got the nursery to sort out. All right, all right, here. He hands over the money. Mr. Lyon exits. Mrs. Lyons considers what she's about to do and then calls. Mrs. Lyons, Mr. Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, would you come out here for a moment, please? Mrs. Johnson enters. Yes. Sit down. Richard and I have been talking it over and, well, the thing is, we both think it would be better if you left. Left where? It's your work. Your work has deteriorated. But I work the way I've always worked. Well, I'm sorry, we're not satisfied. What will I do? How are we going to live without me job? Yes, well, we thought of that. He is... He is... She pushes the money into Mrs. Johnson's hands. It's a lot of money, but... Well... Mrs. Johnson thinking, desperate, trying to get it together. Okay, all right, all right, Mrs. Lyons, right. If I'm going, I'm taking me son with me, I'm taking... As Mrs. Johnson moves towards the cot, Mrs. Lyons roughly drags her out of the way. Oh, no, you're not. Edward is my son. Mine. I'll tell someone. I'll tell the police. I'll bring the police in and... No, no, you won't. You gave your baby away. Don't you realise what a crime that is? You'll be locked up. You sold your baby. Mrs. Johnson, horrified, sees the bundle of notes in her hand and throws it across the room. I didn't. You told me and you said I could see him every day. Well, I'll tell someone. I'm going to tell. Mrs. Johnson starts to leave, but Mrs. Lyons stops her. No, you'll tell nobody. Music. Because, because if you tell anyone, and these children learn the truth, then you know what will happen, don't you? You know what they'll say about the twins secretly parted, don't you? Mrs. Johnson, terrified. What? What? They say... They say that if either twin learns that he was once a pair, they shall both immediately die. It means, Mrs. Johnson, that 
these brothers shall grow up unaware of each other's existence they should be raised apart and never ever told what was once the truth you won't tell anyone about this mrs johnson because if you do you will kill them mrs johnson picks up the money and thrusts it into mrs johnson's hands mrs johnson turns and walks away narrator singing she was upon the table and a spider's been killed someone broke the looking glass a full moon shining and the salt's been spilled you're walking on the pavement cracks don't know what's going to come to pass now you know the devil's got your number you know he's going to find you you know he's right behind you he's staring through your windows he's creeping down the hall ain't no point in clutching at your rosary you're always going to know what was done even when you shut your eyes you still see that you sold a son and you can't tell anyone but you know the devil's got your number you know he's going to find you you know he's right behind you he's staring through your windows he's creeping down the hall yes you know the devil's got your number he's going to find you you know he's right behind you he's standing on your step and he's knocking at your door he's knocking at your door he's knocking at your door the narrator exits during the song mrs johnson has gone to her house and locked herself in mickey aged seven is knocking incessantly at the door he's carrying a toy gun mrs johnson screaming go away mother will you open the bleeding door or what mrs johnson realizing with, with relief off mickey mrs johnson comes to open the door ma'am ma'am she grabs him and hugs him he extricates himself why was the door bolted do you think it was a rent man she laughs and looks at him ma'am our sammy's robbed me and the other gun was me best one why does he rob me all the things off me mrs johnson because you're the youngest mickey it used to happen to our sammy when he was the youngest ma'am we're playing mounted police and indians i'm a mountie ma'am ma'am you know this morning we've wiped out a thousand indians good mickey aiming the gun at her and firing ma'am ma'am you're dead so as you can see here the text is a little bit smaller now because i want us to kind of go through big chunks of the text and like i said i'll be stopping every now and again just to explain some things for you uh, to pose questions to you and to offer some analysis as well so we're starting off where we left off mrs johnson with her son mickey and if you remember she locked herself in the bathroom realized it was mickey out there she kind of softens a bit when she sees him so let's pick that up here so mrs johnson staring at him hmm what's up ma'am nothing son go on you go out and play there's a good lad but hey don't you go playing with those hooligans down the rough end mickey on his way out we're down the other end near the big houses in the park mickey come here what what did you say where have you been playing ma'am i'm sorry i forgot what have i told you about playing up near there come here she grabs him now notice the difference suddenly she's gone from being soft hasn't she she softened to suddenly look at her language look at all the the commands the imperatives you know come here she grabs him so she's gone very quickly hasn't she in a character let's look at why so mickey it wasn't my fault honest so whose fault was it then the indians they rode up that way they were trying to escape don't you ever go up there do you hear me yeah you let our sammy go up there our sammy's older than you but why just shut up never mind why don't you go up near there go on get out and play but you stay outside the front door where i can see you ah oh, but mum the go on mrs johnson exits mickey makes his way outside he's fed up desultory shoots down a few imaginary indians but somehow the magic has gone out of genocide genocide meaning killing lots of people so again it's a bit of a humorous statement there from willie russell he's saying that he's lost his he's, you know his fun but there's a lot of mentions to death have you noticed that when he shoots his mum and says you're dead in the last page here we've got mentions of death again so a lot of that uh, foreboder we mentioned before foreshadowing obviously we know what's going to happen to these two twins and willie russell likes to mention it again and again mickey sits bored looking at the ants on the pavement mickey reciting i wish it was our sammy our sammy's nearly ten he's got two worms in a catapult he's built an underground den but i'm not allowed to go in there i have to stay near the gate because me mam says i'm only seven but i'm not i'm nearly eight I sometimes hate our sammy he robbed my toy car you know now the wheels are missing and the tops broke off and the bleeding thing won't go 
and he said when he took it it was just like that but it wasn't it went dead straight but you can't say nothing when they think you're seven and you're not you're nearly eight i wish it was our sammy you want to see him spit straight in the eye from twenty yards and every time a hit he's allowed to play with matches and he goes to bed dead late and i have to go at seven even though i'm nearly eight you know our sammy he draws nudie women without arms or legs or even heads in the baths when he goes swimming but i'm not allowed to go to the baths me mum says i have to wait because i might get drowned because i'm only seven but i'm not i'm nearly eight you know our sammy you know what he sometimes does he wheezes straight through the letterbox of the house next door to us i tried to do it one night but i had to stand on a crate because i couldn't reach the letterbox but i will by the time i'm eight bored and petulant mickey sits and shoots an imaginary sammy again a bit of foreshadowing there and did you notice that in that song in that section that he recites a lot of the things he does or that sammy does are the things that his mum mentioned before he she didn't want her son to do so it's almost like that cycle of life that they can't escape edward also aged seven appears he's bright and forthcoming hello mickey suspiciously hello i've seen you before where you were playing with some other boys near my house do you live up in the park yes are you going to come and play there again no i would do but i'm not allowed why because me mam says well my mummy doesn't allow me to play down here actually gives a sweet all right he offers a bag from his pocket mickey's shocked what here mickey trying to work out the catch suspiciously taking one can i have another one for our sammy yes of course take as many as you want now notice straight away the difference in the way these two characters speak one speaking very much with slang isn't he giz a sweet and then look at the reaction of edward all right <laughs> um yes of course speaks very proper so you can see how the two characters reflect their mums don't they and their backgrounds and their upbringings so back to the sweets mickey taking a handful are you soft i don't think so round here if you ask for a sweet you have to ask about about 20 million times and you know what edward's sitting beside mickey what they still don't bleed and give you one sometimes our sammy does but you have to be dead careful if our sammy gives you a sweet why because if our sammy gives you a sweet he's usually weed on it first edward exploded in giggles oh that sounds like super fun it is if you are sammy do you want to come and play i might do but i'm not playing now because i'm pissed off edward awed pissed off you say smashing things don't you do you know more words like that yeah yeah i know loads of words like that you know like the f word edward clueless pardon the f word edward is still puzzled mickey looks round to check that he cannot be overheard then whispers the word to edward the two of them immediately wriggle and giggle, wriggle with glee what does it mean i don't know sounds good though doesn't it fantastic when i get home i'll look it up in the dictionary in the what in the dictionary don't you know what a dictionary is of course i do it, it's, it's it's a thingy isn't it a book which explains the meaning of words the meaning of words yeah Ah, oh, sammy will be in there here soon i hope he's in a good mood he's a dead mean sometimes why because he's got a plate in his head a plate in his head yeah when he was little me man was at work and our don marie was supposed to be looking after him but he fell out the window and broke his head so they took him to the hospital and put a plate in his head a plate a dinner plate i don't think so because our sammy says not really that big i think it must have been one of them little plates they have bread off a side plate no it's on the top and can you see the shape of it in his head i suppose i suppose if you looked under his hair edward after a reflective pause you know the most smashing things will you be my best friend yeah if you want what's your name michael johnston but everyone calls me mikey what's yours edward lyons 
Do they call you Eddie? No. Well, I will. Will you? Yeah. How old are you, Eddie? Seven. I'm older than you. I'm nearly eight. Well, I'm nearly eight, really. What's your birthday? July the 18th. So's mine. Is it really? Aye. We were born on the same day. That means we can be blood brothers. Do you want to be my blood brother, Eddie? Yes, please. Mickey producing a penknife. It hurts, you know. He puts a nick in his hand. Now give us yours. Mickey nicks Edward's hand and they clamp hands together. See, this means that we're blood brothers and, and that we'll always have to stand by each other. Now you say after me, I will always defend my brother. I will always defend my brother and stand by him and stand by him and share my sweets with him and share... Sammy leaps in front of them, gun in hand, pointed at them. So notice what they've done. Obviously, it's called blood brothers and that's because obviously they are related by blood, but also... We've got a bit of that foreshadowing again, haven't we? Blood, the fact that we know they're going to die. So all the way through, right from the beginning, it hasn't taken them long to make this uh, pact, has it? But right at the beginning, we know from that reference to blood that they're destined for death, that they are destined for tragedy, that it's bound to happen because of all this blood brother stuff. Sammy leaps in front of them, gun in hand, pointed at them. Hiya, Sammy. Give the sweet. I haven't got any. Yes, you have. Mikey frantically shakes his head, trying to shut Edward up. Yes, I, I gave you one for Sammy, remember? Sammy laughs at Edward's voice and Mickey's misfortune. You robin get? No, I'm not. He hands over a sweet. And anyway, you pinch me best gun. Mickey tries to snatch the gun from Sammy, but Sammy's too fast. It's last anyway. He only fires caps. I'm going to get a real gun soon. I'm going to get an air gun. Sammy goes into a fantasy shootout. He doesn't notice Edward, who's approached him and is craning to get a close look at his head, eventually, eventually noticing. What's she looking at? Pardon? That's Eddie. He lives up by the park. He's a friggin' poshy. No, he's not. He's my best friend. Sammy's snorting, deciding it's not worth the bother. He is soft. He's just soft little kids. In quiet disdain, he moves away. Where you going? Sammy looking at Mikey. I'm going to do another burial. Me worms have died again. Again, all this time, Willie Russell is mentioning death. Have you noticed how many times death's mentioned? Really laying it thick, isn't he? That we know what's going to happen. Mickey excitedly to Edward. Oh, you're coming the funeral? Oh, Sammy's having a funeral? Can we come, Sammy? Sammy puts his hand into his pocket and brings forth a handful of soil. Look, they were alive and wriggling this morning, but by dinner time they were dead. Mickey and Edward inspect the deceased worms in Sammy's hand. Mrs. Johnston enters. Mikey, Mikey! Is that your mummy? Ma'am, ma'am, this is me brother. Mrs. Johnston stunned. What? My, my blood brother, Eddie. Eddie? E Eddie who? Eddie, Edward Lyons, Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson stands still staring at him. So obviously she's in shock. She knows. So when she says, this is my brother, that was a huge shock to, to Mrs. Johnston. Eddie's my best friend, ma'am. He lives up by the park and... Mikey, get in the house. What? Sammy, you and all. Both of you get in. But I'm older than him. I don't have to. I said, get in the pair of you. Mickey, going almost in tears. But I haven't done nothing. I'll see you, Eddie. To Eddie. Mikey exits. Mrs. Johnston. Sammy! Sammy, ah, to Edward. I'll get you. Have I done something wrong, Mrs. Johnston? Does your mother know you're down here? Edward shakes his head. And what would she say if she know? She did know? I... I think she'd be angry. So, you don't think you'd better get home before she finds out? Yes. Go on, then. Edward runs, turns to go and stops. Could I... would it be all right if I came to play with Mickey on another day? Or perhaps he could come to play at my house? Don't you ever come round here again. Ever. But ever. Now go on, beat it. Go home before the bogeyman gets you. Edward walks towards his home. As he goes, Mrs Johnston sings. Should we meet again? Will not recognise your name. 
You can be sure what's gone before will be concealed. Your friends will never learn that once we were on easy terms. Mr. and Mrs. Lyons enters their house as Edward walks home. Edward reaches his home and walks in. His mother hugs him and his father produces a toy gun for him. Edward, delighted, seizes it and shoots his father, who sprightly dies to Edward's great amusement. Edward and his father romp on the floor. Mrs. Lyons settles herself in an armchair with a storybook, calling Edward over. Edward goes and sits with her, Mrs. Lyons joining them and sitting on the arm of the chair. So notice how different their lifestyles are. So Willie Russell's deliberately done this, hasn't he? Where one has got nothing, not a toy gun. The other one, they produce a toy gun, a bit more foreshadowing about death, and then sits in a chair to read. So really different. They call that juxtaposition. Their lives are so different. They're contrasted together. Mrs. Johnston turns and goes to her house at the end of the song. Mrs. Lyons gets up and walks towards the door. Daddy, we haven't finished the story yet. Mummy will read the story, Edward. I've got to work for an hour. Mrs. Lyons gets up and goes to her husband. Edward goes to the bookshelf and leafs through a dictionary. Richard, didn't you say... Darling, I'm sorry, but if we complete this merger, I will, I promise you, have more time. That's why we're doing it, Jen. If we complete this, the firm will run itself, and I'll have plenty of time to spend with you both. So if you remember um, last session, we ended where um, we were in the Lyons household, where uh, Edward was um, kind of feeling like his dad was a bit distant. His dad said he had to go to work. He, he works a lot. Um, so it gave his son a gun, um, and his mother got the storybook out. So let's pick up where we left off with Mrs. Lyons. I just, it's not me, Edward. You should spend more time with him. I don't want, I don't want him growing away from you. Daddy, how do you spell bogeyman? Ask mummy, darling. I'll see you later now, mustache. Mr. Lyons exits. Now notice Mr. Lyons is very distant, isn't he? Look at the, the way he spoke there. Ask mummy, full stop. Darling, I'll see you later tomorrow full stop mustache he doesn't even um bother to speak in full sentences at the end there mustache you know so it, again it, it gives the impression that he's not interested we could use the word apathetic there a p a t h e t i c not bothered not interested and he certainly doesn't seem interested does he and that's important particularly later on as we read on in this play so mr lyons exits mummy how do you spell bogeyman hmm bogeyman Mrs. Lyons laughing. Edward, where did you hear such a thing? I'm trying to look it up. There's no such thing as a bogeyman. It's a, it's a superstition, the sort of thing a silly mother might say to her children. The bogeyman will get you. Will he get me? Edward, I've told you, there's no such thing. So again, we see uh, Willie Russell is deliberately reminding us that Mrs. Lyons isn't superstitious. Um, she doesn't buy into that, um, whereas obviously Mrs. Johnston does, and she's the one who's planted that into Edward's head. The doorbell is heard. Mrs. Lyons goes to answer the door. Mickey off. Does Eddie live here? Pardon? Does he? Is he coming out to play, eh? Edward shouting. Mickey! Mickey enters, pursued by Mrs. Lyons. Hiya, Eddie. I've got our Sammy's catapult. You're coming out. Oh, he takes the catapult and tries a practice shot. It's, it's, isn't Mickey fantastic, Mum? Do you go to the same school as Edward? No. Mickey says some smashing things. We're blood brothers, aren't we, Mickey? Yeah, we were born on the same day. Come on, Mickey, let's go. Edward, Edward, it's time for bed. M Mummy, it's not. Mrs. Lyons takes over and ushers Mickey out. I'm very sorry, but it's Edward's bedtime. Mummy, mummy, it's it's early. Mrs. Lyon exits with Mickey to show him out. Then she returns. So obviously she's desperate to separate them and do anything. So we see a desperation there again. Mummy, Edward, Edward, where did you meet that boy? Oh, at his house. And, and his second name is Johnston, isn't it? Yes, and I think you're a very, very mean... I've told you never to go where that boy, where boys like that live. But why? Because, because you're not the same as him. You're not, do you understand? No, I don't understand, and I hate you. Mrs. Lyons almost crying. Edward, Edward, don't. It's, 
What I'm doing is only for your own good. It's only because I love you, Edward. You don't, you don't. If you love me, you'd let me go out with Mickey because he's my best friend. I like him more than you. Edward, Edward, don't say that. Don't ever say that. Well, well, it's true. And I will say it. I know what you are. What? What? You're, you're a fuck off. Mrs. Lyons hits Edward hard instinctively. So straight away, obviously, it's a bit funny there because Edward's used the word wrong there. But look at Mrs. Lyons' reaction there, how she's hit him. Same reaction that Mrs. Johnston had, didn't she, with, with, with Mickey. So we've got a, a kind of a mirroring there, which will be important later. You see, you see why I don't want you mixing with boys like that. You'd filth from them and behave like this, like a, like a horrible little boy like them. But you're not like them. You are my son, mine, and you won't, you won't ever. And desperation there in the repetition, the, the possessive pronoun, you're mine. And again, she doesn't realise what she's doing, does she? But she's, she's kind of pushing him away by trying to pull him in. She notices the terror in Edward's face and realises how heavy she's been. Gently, she pulls him to her and cradles him. Oh, my son, my beautiful, beautiful son. The scene fades as the next scene begins. We hear cap guns and the sound of children making Indian whoops. The children rush onto the street playing cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, goodies and baddies, etc. Okay, so at this point, the, the children are all playing. It's just mentioned there, goodies and baddies, cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians. Notice that we've got the, the, the two different sides there, haven't we, in each of those scenarios. And that perhaps represents... The, the two different families, the Johnstons and the Lions, and how they're both on separate sides at this point. During the battle, Mrs. Lyons exits. Edward remains on stage in the background as though in his garden, watching and noticed by the battling children. Mickey and Linda are in one gang, Sammy in another. Sammy singing a cappella, kids rhyme, so singing without any music. I got you, I shot you, and I bloody know he did. I got you, I shot you. Linda, I stopped it with the bin lid. There's a mass of derisive jeers from the other side. Music. But you know that if you cross your fingers, if you count from one to ten, you can get up off the ground again. It doesn't matter. The whole thing's just a game. The shooting starts all over again. A kid raps on the door of the house. Linda, as a mole, enters. My name's Elliot Ness and lady, here's my card. I'm looking for one Al Capone. To lackeys. Mac, check the back, Sarge. You check the yard. But pal, I've told you, Al ain't home. We'll see Al make a break for it. Ness shoots him like he was eating his breakfast. So, lady, can I use your telephone? As Ness goes to the phone and orders a hearse, we see Al get up and sing the chorus with the other children. So a hearse is something that you carry a, a dead body in. So look at all those references to death again. He loves it, doesn't he, this uh, Willie Russell? But you know that if your fingers, if you cross your fingers and count from one to ten, you can get off the ground again. It doesn't matter. The whole thing's just a game. Now think about the significance of that line. It's repeated twice there. And we know what happens at the beginning, don't we? We know these two boys die. And what they're saying is, ah, but it, it, the whole thing's just a game. And perhaps that's going to be an important thing later. The kid who is playing Al becomes a cowboy. He turns to face Sammy and sings. Cowboy, when I say draw, you better grab that gun. And maybe say a little prayer, because I'm the fastest draw that man ever you ever saw. Call up your woman and say goodbye to her, because you know you're going right down there. And he draws his gun on Sammy. Sammy produces a bazooka and blows him off the stage. All. But you know that if you cross your fingers and if you count from one to ten, you can get up off the ground again. It doesn't matter. The whole thing's just a game. Well, see, it isn't a game. It's all very real. Later on, a small group of children become a brigade of US troops. Sergeant, okay men, let's get them, with a hand grenade. Let's see them try and get out of this. He's a hot shot sergeant from the 9th Brigade. He's never been known to miss. Sergeant to grenade. Come on, give daddy a kiss. He pulls the pin and lobs it. His brigade cover their ears and crouch down. Linda catches the grenade and lobs it back at them. After being blown to pieces, they get up singing the chorus along with the enemy. But you know that if you cross your fingers, and if you count from 1 to 10, you can get up off the ground again. It doesn't matter. The whole thing's just a game. Sammy comes forward as Professor Howe carrying a condom filled with water. My name's Professor Howe, and this bomb I hold, it can destroy the atmosphere. I've primed it, I've timed it to explode, unless you get me out of here. No, they don't. Then I suggest you cover your ears. There's an explosion which tops them all. 
Out of it comes the children singing the chorus. But you know that if you cross your fingers and if you count from one to ten, you can get up off the ground again. It doesn't matter. The whole thing's just a game. The whole thing's just a game. The whole thing's just a... Sammy interrupting, chanting. You're dead. You know you are. I got you standing near that car. But when you did, his hand was hid behind his back. His fingers crossed and so no he's not. So you fuck off. And all the children, apart from Mickey and Linda, point and chant the accusing ah. Mickey is singled out, accused. The rest, led by Sammy, suddenly chant at Mickey and point. All chanting, you said the F word, you're going to die. You're going to hell and there you'll fry, just like a fish in a chip shop fat. Only 25 million times hotter than that. They all laugh at Mickey. Linda moves in to protect Mickey, who's visibly shaken. Notice how he believes all this, that all these superstitions they're mentioning and how it seems that Willie Russell suggesting that this is part of maybe the, the working class society. Maybe he's saying that uneducated people believe in these things. Maybe he's making a reference to religion as well. But again, we can come back to that later. Linda. Well, well, all you lot swear. So you'll all go to hell with him. No, we won't, Linda. Why? Because when we swear, we cross our fingers. Well, my fingers were crossed. Children variously, no they weren't, liar, come off it, I seen them. Leave them alone. Why? What do you do about it if we don't? Linda, undaunting, approaching Sammy. I'll tell me mother. Why all us siggies will always disappear when you're in our house. What? And, half, and, half, and the half crowns, which is coins. Sammy suddenly, come on gang, let's go. We don't want to play with these anyway, they're just kids. The other children fire a barrage of shots at Mickey. And Linda before they rush off. I hate them. Linda notices Mickey quietly crying. What's up? I don't want to die. But you have to, Mickey. Everyone does. She starts to dry his tears. Like your twin, he died, didn't he? When he was a baby. See, look on the bright side of it, Mickey. When you die, you'll meet your twinny again, won't you? Yeah. And listen, Mickey, if you're dead, there's no school, is there? Mickey's smiling. And I don't care about our Sammy anyway. Look, he produces an air pistol. He thinks no one knows he's got it. But I know where he hides it. Linda impressed. Ooh, guess a go. No, come on. Let's go get Eddie first. Who? Come on, I'll show you. They go as if to Edward's garden. Mickey, loud but conspiratorially. Eddie, Eddie, you're coming out. I, my mum says I haven't got to play with you. Well, my mum says I've got to play with you, but take no notice of mothers. They're soft. Come on, I've got Linda with me. She's a girl, but she's all right. Edward decides to risk it and creeps out. Hiya. Hiya, Mickey. Hello, Linda. Hiya, Eddie. She produces the air pistol. Look, we've got Sammy's air gun. Come on, Eddie. You can have a shot at our target in the park. Peter Pan. We always shoot at that, don't we, Linda? Yeah, we try and shoot his little thingy off, don't we, Mickey? They all laugh. Come on, gang, let's go. Edward's standing firm. But, Mickey, I mean, suppose we get caught by a policeman. Ah, take no notice. We've been caught loads of times by a policeman, haven't we, Linda? Oh, my God, yeah, hundreds of times more than that. We say dead funny things to them, don't we, Linda? What sort of funny things? All sorts, don't we, Mickey? Yeah, like, you know, when they ask what your name is, we say things like... Adolf Hitler, don't we, Linda? Yeah. And hey, Eddie, do you know what they say? Do you know what they think you're doing? We always say something like, waiting for the 92 bus. Mickey and Linda crease with laughter. Come on. Edward, greatly impressed. Do you, do you really? Goodness, that's fantastic. Come on, bunk under your fence, Ma won't see you. Mickey, Linda and Edward exit. Mrs. Lyons enters the garden. Mrs. Lyons calling, Edward, Edward, Edward. The narrator enter enters. Music. There's gypsies in the wood, and they've been watching you. They're going to take your baby away. There's gypsies in the wood, and they've been calling you. Can Edward please come out and play? Please, can he come out with us and play? You know the devil's got your number. You know he's going to find you. You know he's right behind you. He's staring through your windows. He's creeping down the hall. Mr. Lyons enters the garden. So as a little recap, you may remember the last time that we read, uh, we had 
uh, Mickey and Eddie and Linda talking together. Um, we had Eddie running away and we're at the point now where Mrs. Lyons doesn't realise he's gone. Um, so we'll get some reaction from Mrs. Lyons and Mr. Lyons on what's just happened. So Mrs. Lyons enters the garden. Mrs. Lyons calling, Edward, Edward, Edward. The narrator enters, music. The narrator singing, there's gypsies in the wood and they've been watching you. They're going to take your baby away. There's gypsies in the wood and they've been calling you. Can Edward please come out and play? Please can he come with us and play? You know the devil's got your number. You know he's going to find you. You know he's right behind you. He's staring through your windows. He's creeping down the hall. So we get that refrain mentioned many times through the play, almost like a, that, that word we looked at a few weeks ago, foreboding, foreshadowing, is that very, it's quite creepy, isn't it, the way it's worded? And that's meant to be that way, isn't it? Because it's that kind of reminder for Mrs. Lyons that her son um, is, co is kind of being distanced from her, her worst fears being realised. So Mr. Lyons enters the garden. Oh, Richard, Richard. For God's sake, Jennifer, I told you on the phone, he's just out playing somewhere. But where? Outside somewhere, with friends. Edward, but I don't want him out playing. Jennifer, he's not a baby. Edward, I don't care. I don't care. For Christ's sake, you bring me home from work in the middle of the day just to say you haven't seen him in an hour. Perhaps we should be talking about you getting something for your nerves. There's nothing wrong with my nerves. It's just, just this place. I hate it, Richard. I don't want to stay here anymore. I want to move. Jennifer. Jennifer, how many times? The factory is here. My work is here. It doesn't have to be somewhere far away, but we have to, we've got to move, Richard, because if we stay here, I feel that something terrible will happen, something bad. Again, there's that foreboding. And think about the way that Mr. Lyons is presented here as well. Quite similar, I think, to the presentation of Mrs. Johnston's husband, you know, distant, cold, uncaring. Again, is this maybe the, the way the characters are, or is this part of the context? Is this just the way that men were expected to behave during this time period? Um, is it still true today? That's a question I'll just leave with you. Mr. Lyons sighs and puts his arm around Mrs. Lyons. Look, Jen, what is this thing you keep talking about getting away from, hmm? It's just, it's these people, these people that Edward has started mixing with. Can you see how he's drawn to them? They're, they're drawing him away from me. Mr. Lyons, in despair, turns away from her. Oh, Christ. He turns to look at her, but she looks away. He sighs and absently bends to pick up a pair of children's shoes from the floor. Again, think about the importance of those shoes. We had that motif, that symbol earlier, didn't we, with the shoes on the table. So that's obviously important, maybe a sign of the, the children growing up. Uh, the sign of the journey, which is one of our key concepts, because obviously shoes are linked to walking away, uh, linked to a journey that perhaps her son's on. I do really think you should see a doctor. Mrs. Lyon snapping. I don't need to see a doctor. I just need to move away from this neighbourhood because I'm frightened. I'm frightened for Edward. Mr. Lyons places the shoes on the table, turning on her. So again, very important what's just happened there. We might miss that if we're not careful, but that's there on purpose, isn't it? Reminding us, your shoes are on the table. Uh, that, that omen from the beginning. Frightened of what woman? Wheeling to face him. Frightened of? She's stopped by the sight of the shoes on the table. She rushes at the table and sweeps the shoes off. So think about her character, how she's changed and developed from the beginning when she was very realistic, very down to earth, very logical. Now she's beginning to believe these superstitions, uh, even some that she came up with herself, didn't she, to manipulate Mrs. Johnston. Music. Narrator singing. There's shoes upon the table and a spider's been killed. Someone broke the looking glass. There's a full moon shining and the salt's been spilled. You're walking on pavement cracks. You don't know what's going to come to pass. Now you know the devil's got your number. He's going to find you. You know he's right behind you. He's staring through your windows. He's creeping down the hall. The song ends with a percussion build to a sudden full stop. And the scene snaps from Mrs. Lyons to the children. To think about the percussion building there, building the tension. The tension's rising and then it snaps. So again, is that perhaps foreshadowing the sudden deaths of these two twins? Mickey, Eddie and Linda are standing in line, taking in turns to fire the air pistol. Mickey takes aim and fires. Linda with glee. Missed? Edward lows and fires. Missed? 
Linda takes the gun and fires. We hear a metallic ping. She beams a satisfied smile as Mickey, who ignores it and reloads, fires. The routine is repeated with exactly the same outcome until. So look at the way that women are presented, female characters are presented here. We've got Linda, clearly more accurate as a name, um, more competent with a gun. Again, is perhaps Russell defying stereotypes with Linda? You know, think about how she's not doing the things that perhaps should be expected of a girl at the time. Maybe she's presented as a more strong, independent character. Mickey taking the gun. We're not playing with this gun no more. He puts it away. Ah, why? Gets broke if you use it too much. What are we going to do now, Mickey? I don't know. I do. What? Let's throw some stones through them windows. Mickey brightening. Ooh, I dare you, Linda. I dare you. Linda bending for a stone. Well, I will. I'm not scared either. Are you Eddie? Um. well, um, he is, look. Eddie's scared. No, he isn't. I, Eddie. Edix, Edward, Edward stoically. No. No, I'm not. I'm not scared at all, actually. Right. When I count to three, we all throw together. One, two, three. Unseen by them, a policeman has approached behind them. Your mother caught a flea. She put it in the teapot to make a cup of tea. And what do you think you're doing? Linda and Mickey shoot terrified glances at Edward, almost wetting themselves. Edward, meek, mistaking their look for encouragement. Waiting for the 92 bus... He explodes with laughter. He's not with us, sir, sir. No, he's definitely with us. What's your name, son? Adolf Hitler. Edward laughs until, through the laughter, he senses that all is not well. He sees that he alone is laughing. The laughter turns to tears, which sets the other two off. The three children turn around, crying, bawling, followed by the policeman. The three children exit. Think about how they've led him on there. They've manipulated him. Perhaps a little bit of something that happened um, previously with Mrs. Lyons manipulating Mrs. Johnston. Now we've got um, them him being manipulated by Mrs. Johnston's children. So maybe it's a bit of like a, a cycle going on there. Mrs. Johnston enters. The policeman goes to confront Mrs. Johnston. And he was about to commit a serious crime, love. Now, you do understand that. You don't want to end up in court again, do you? Mrs. Johnston shakes her head. Well, that's what's going to happen if I have any more trouble from one of yours. I warned you last time, didn't I, Mrs. Johnston, about your Sammy? So think about the way he's reacted there to Mrs. Johnston. Quite prejudiced, isn't it? Mrs. Johnston nods, very submissive to authority. Well, there'll be no more bloody warnings from now on. Either you'll keep them in order, Mrs., or it'll be the courts for you. Or worse, won't it? Mrs. Johnson nods. Yes, it will. As the policeman turns and goes towards the lion's house, music is heard. Mrs. Johnson singing. Maybe some day we'll move away and start all over again in some new place. So as a quick recap, so previously on Blood Brothers, uh, you might remember that uh, the policeman caught Eddie uh, throwing stones and we had him being quite defiant to the policeman but he didn't really realize what he was doing we saw the policeman speaking really condescendingly speaking down to mrs johnston obviously he's had run-ins in with, with her before and feels she's less than him and we're picking up m midway through her song so we'll start there right at the top where they don't know my face and nobody's heard my name we can begin again and feel we can win and then maybe the music tails off as we see the policeman confronting Mr. Lyons. The policeman has removed his helmet and holds a glass of scotch. Edward is there. So think about the way the policeman is now acting. His helmet's off, which suggests he's comfortable, suggests that he feels he's more of an equal with Mr. Lyons, and he's got a glass of scotch as well. Now that kind of gives us the indication that he's relaxed, that he's friendly, that he's um, he feels at home. Um, and he's lost his inhibitions, he's drinking alcohol with um, Mr. Lyons. So already we get on the stage when we see him an indication that he's going to treat him and Mrs. Lyons very differently. So the policeman. And uh, as I say, it was more of a prank, really, Mr. Lyons. Uh, I'd just dock his pocket money if I was you. <laughs> but one thing I do would say, if you don't mind me saying, is, is well, I'm not sure I'd let him mix with the likes of them in the future. Make sure he keeps his own kind, Mr. Lyons. Well, uh, thanks for the drink, sir. 
All the best now. He's a good lad, aren't you, Adolf? Good night, sir. He replaces his helmet. The policeman leaves. So again, look at his laughing there. He's very relaxed. He, he just says, dock his pocket money like it's nothing. Even though Eddie was the one who was defiant and was the one caught in the act. So Mr. Lyons. Edward, how would you like to move to another house? Why, Daddy? Um, well, various reasons, really. Um, actually, Mummy's not been too well lately, and we thought a move, perhaps further out towards the country somewhere, might... Do you think you'd like that? I want to stay here. Well, do think about it, old chap. Edward leaves his house, goes to the Johnston's door. He knocks at the door. Mrs. Johnston answers the door. Hello, Mrs. Johnston. How are you? You are? I I'm sorry, is there something wrong? No, I just... I don't usually have kids inquiring about me health. I'm, er... Um, I'm all right. And how are you, Master Lyons? Very well, thank you. Mrs. Johnston looks at Edward for a moment. Yeah, you look it. You look very well. Does your mother look after you? Of course. Now, listen, Eddie. I told you not to come round here again. I'm sorry, I just wanted to see Mickey. No, it's not best if... I won't be coming here again, ever. We're moving away to the country. Lucky you. But I'd much rather live here. Would you? When are you going? tomorrow. Oh, so we really won't see you again, eh? Edward shakes his head and begins to cry. What's up? Edward through his tears. I don't want to go. I want to stay here where my friends are, where Mickey is. Come here. She takes him, cradling him, letting him cry. Now look again at the way that she's treated him against the way his own mother and father have treated him. They're quite cold and distant. This is the way it is. And she's cradling him. So we've got the imagery of being a baby or an infant there. No, listen, listen, don't be soft. You'll probably love it in your new house. You'll meet loads of new friends and in no time you'll be forgetting Mickey ever existed. I won't, I won't, I'll never forget. Shh, shush. Listen, listen, Eddie. Here's you wanting to stay here and here's me. I've been trying to get out for years. We're a pair, aren't we, me and y you and me? Why don't you, Mrs. Johnson? Why don't you buy a new house near us? Or well, just like that? Yes, yes. Eh? Yes. Would you like a picture of Mickey to take with you, so you can remember him? Yes, please. She removes a locket from around her neck. See, look, there's Mickey there. He was just a young kid when that was taken. And is that you, Mrs. Johnson? She nods. Can I really have this? Yeah, but keep it a secret, eh, Eddie? Just our secret between you and me. Edward smiling. All right, Mrs. Johnson. He puts the locket around his neck. Now remember what we talked about before. Anytime we get a prop, anytime we get an object on the stage, it's always significant. So this locket will obviously be important later on. The fact that he's put it around his neck suggests it's going to be found, doesn't it? He looks at her a moment too long. What are you looking at? I thought you didn't like me. I thought you weren't very nice, but, but I think you're smashing. Mrs. Jo Johnson looking at him. God help the girls when you start dancing. Pardon? Nothing. Calling into the house. Mickey, say goodbye to Eddie. He's moving. Mickey comes out of the house. Music is quietly introduced. Eddie moves to Mickey and gives him a small parcel from his pocket. Mickey unwraps a toy gun. The two boys clasp hands and wave goodbye. Mrs. Johnson and Mickey watch as Edward joins his parents dressed in outdoor clothes on the side of the stage. Goodbye. Well, Edward, do you like it here? Edward unenthusiastically. It's very nice. Oh, look, Edward. Look at those trees and those cows. Oh, Edward, you're going to like it so much out here, aren't you? Yes. Are you feeling better now, Mummy? Much better now, darling. Oh, Edward, look. Look at those birds. Look at that lovely black and white one. Edward immediately covering his eyes. Don't, Mummy. Don't look. It's a magpie. Never look at a magpie. It's one for sorrow. So that again is a superstition, a famous superstition, and obviously he's bought into it, that key theme running through. Mr. Lyons, Edward, it's just a superstition. It's not. Mickey told me. Edward, I think we can forget the silly things that Mickey said. I'm going inside. I want to read. Edward exits. Mr. Lyons comforting his wife. 
Children take time to adapt to new surroundings. He'll be as right as rain in a few days. He won't even remember he once lived somewhere else. Mrs. Lyons forces a smile and allows herself to be led inside by her husband. Mickey rings the doorbell of Edward's old house. A woman answers the door. Yes? Is, uh, is Eddie in? Eddie? I'm afraid Eddie doesn't live here now. Oh, yeah. He stands looking at the woman. Goodbye. Do you, do you, um, do you know where he lives now? Pardon? I, see, I've, I've got some money. I was going to go on the bus and see him. Where does he live now? I'm afraid I've no idea. Somewhere in the country, isn't it? Look, I honestly don't know. I'm rather busy. Goodbye. The woman closes the door on Mickey. And Mickey, uh, doors are quite important throughout this play. You'll notice that you had earlier Eddie knocking on the door of Mrs. Johnson. You've got um, here Mickey knocking on the door. It's about doors and barriers, about people being kept, kept outside of each other. So it's about the kind of, again, society and how people are closed off and isolated. Mickey wanders away, aimless and bored, deserted and alone. Music. Mickey singing. No kids out on the street today. You could be living on the moon. Maybe everybody's packed their bags and moved away. Going to be a long, long, long Sunday afternoon. Just killing time and kicking cans around. Trying to remember jokes I knew. Telling them to myself, but they're not funny since I found it's going to be a long, long Sunday afternoon. Edward, in his garden, equally bored and alone, the scene appears in such a way that we don't know if it's real or in Mickey's mind. My best friend always had sweets to share. He knew every word in the dictionary. He was clean, neat and tidy. From Monday to Friday, I wish I could be like that. Wear clean clothes, talk properly like, do sums and history like. My friend, my friend. Again, important that we don't know if it's in his mind or not. Because again, it's blurring the lines between reality and the mind, and, the, and that's very important later on. My best friend, he could swear like a soldier. You would laugh till you died, and the stories he told you. He was untidy from Monday to Friday. I wish I could be like kicking a ball and climbing a tree, run around with dirty knees like my friend, my friend. The lights fade on Edward as the mood music shifts back to long Sunday afternoon. Feels like everybody stayed in bed, or maybe I woke up too soon. Am I the last survivor? Is everybody dead? On this long, long Sunday afternoon. Mrs. Johnson appears clutching a letter. So again, very important if we see a prop. Mrs. Johnson singing, Oh, bright new day, we're moving away. Mickey speaking, Ma'am, what's up? Mrs. Johnson singing, We're starting all over again. Donna Marie enters with various neighbours. Donna Marie speaking, is it a summons, mother? Mrs. Johnson singing, Oh, bright new day, we're going away. Mickey, Sammy. Mrs. Johnson addresses the various onlookers. When nobody's heard our name, Sammy enters. I never robbed nothing honest, ma'am. Mrs. Johnson singing, We can begin again, feel like we can win, and then just live like living should be. Got a new situation, a new destination, and no reputation following me. Mickey speaking. What is it? What is it? Mrs. Johnson singing. We're getting out. We're moving house, starting all over again. We're leaving this mess for a new address. Pointing it out. 65 Skelmsadale Lane. Mickey speaking, worried. Where's that man? Sammy speaking. Is that in the country? Donna Marie. What's it like there? The air is so pure, you get drunk just by breathing. And the washing stays clean on the line. Where there's space for their kids, because this garden's so big. It would take you a week just to reach the far side. Come on then, Sammy, Mickey. Now you've all got to help. To the neighbours in a posh voice. Em, would you excuse us? we got a pack. We're moving away. Mrs Johnson and the children go in to pack. Notice that she changed her voice to a more posh voice at that point when she's speaking to the neighbours. Maybe she feels like she's climbed that ladder that we talked about in the bell task. What did she say? They're moving away. Praise the Lord, he's delivered us at last. They're getting out, they're moving house. Life won't be the same as in the past. I can safely predict a sharp drop in the crime rate. It'll be calm and peaceful round here. And now I might even get paid what's mine, mate. And you'll see graffiti will soon disappear. 
Mrs. Johnson marches out of the house carrying battered suitcases, followed by the children who are struggling to get out some of the items mentioned in the verse. Just pack up bags, we're leaving the rags. The wobbly wardrobe, the chest of drawers that never close. The two-legged chair, the carpet so bare. You wouldn't see it if it weren't for the holes. Now that we're moving, now we're improving. Let's wash our hands of this lot. For it's no longer fitting for me to be sitting on a sofa. I know for a fact was knocked off. Her last line is delivered to Sammy, who indicates the policeman trying to get her to shut up. We might get a car. Be all la -de da and go driving in, in the sands. At the weekend, a gentleman friend might take me dancing to the local bands. We'll have a front room. And then, if it should happen, that his holiness flies in from Rome. He can sit there with me eating toast, drinking tea, in the sort of surroundings that remind him of home. So she's starting to dream again, isn't she? Remember at the start when she wanted to be Marilyn Monroe and she lost it. Now she's starting to finally dream again. Mickey speaking. Is it in the country, isn't it, ma'am? Mrs. Johnson speaking. Eh? We'll be all right out there, son. Away from the muck and dirt and all the bloody trouble. Eh, I could dance. Come here. Get off. Mrs. Johnson picks up a picture of the Pope, which is lying next to one of the suitcases and begins to dance. So the Pope's mentioned there, and also we get a picture of the Pope. So not only do you get a sense that the family are, are Roman Catholic, but perhaps there's, a, there's an important part of religion being played in here as well. The superstitions and all the kind of spiritual stuff going on in the background. Mrs. Johnson picks up a picture of the Pope, which is lying next to one of the suitcases and begins to dance. Oh, bright new day. We're moving away. We're starting all over again. We're going away where nobody's heard our name. Hey, what are you laughing at? I'm not laughing. I'm smiling. I haven't seen you happy like this for ages. Well, I am happy now. Hey, Jesus, where's the others? They went near that field, ma'am. Sammy, Sammy, get off that bleeding cow before I kill you. Oh, Jesus, what's our Donna Marie stepped into? Sammy, that cow's a bull. Come here, the pair of you. Now we can begin again. Feel like we can win and then, just like living should be, got a new situation, a new destination, and no reputation following me. We're getting out, we're moving house, we're going away. Getting out today, we're moving, moving, moving house. We're going away, all oh, bright new day. And then curtain. So we're now into Act 2, uh, and we meet Mrs. Johnson again. Now notice that... Um, Mrs. Johnston was the character we met in Act 1, wasn't she? She was the first character, which leads us to believe that this play really isn't about Eddie and Mickey. It's really about Mrs. Johnston, isn't it? Um, and again, we've got this cycle. We started with her. We've got her again. Um, but we've kind of what happens in a lot of tragedies is they get to a point where you think the characters are going to make it. You think, finally, they, they, they're going to get out. And usually that happens at the end of that one. And then we get the, oh, no, they don't. And we know anyway, because we know that they die. So Mrs. Johnson moves forward to sing. The house we got was lovely. The neighbours are a treat. They sometimes fight on Saturday night, but they're never in the week. So look at the expectations there. Well, at least they don't fight in the week. You know, so it's all relative, her um, ideas of success, isn't it? That that's her idea about uh, a good week. You know, there were no fights Monday to Friday. Mrs. Johnson turns and looks next door. Raised voices and a dog barking are heard off. Neighbours off speaking. What time do you call this then? Time I got shot at you, rat bag. Dog barks. Mrs. Johnson singing. Since I pay me bills on time, the milkman insists I call him Joe. He brings me bread and eggs. Joe, the milkman, enters. Says I've got legs like Marilyn Monroe. So again, we've got this cycle again, haven't we? We're right back to where we started, which suggests to us that maybe she's caught in a loop that she can't get out of. You know, maybe this is all just going to go out again and again. and She'll never really escape her class, her uh, background. Mrs. Johnson and Joe dance. Sometimes he takes me dancing, he even takes me dancing. Joe exits, dancing. I know our Sammy burnt the school down, but it's very easily done. If the teacher lets the, lets the silly gets play with magnesium, thank God he only got probation. A judge is seen, ticking Sammy off. The judge was old and slow. Mrs. Johnson sings to the judge, laying on a smile for him. Though it was kind of him, since I reminded him of Marilyn Monroe. Judge, slightly scandalised, and could I take you dancing? Take you dancing. 
Mrs. Johnson takes the judge's gavel and bangs it on the head. The judge exits, stunned. Mrs. Johnson, ah, Mickey's just turned 14. You know he's at that age. Mickey is seen in his room. When you mention girls or courting, he flies into a rage. So Mickey's growing up now. He's now 14. We've had a bit of a, a time jump here. And that will be very important coming up. Mickey's speaking. Shut up talking about me, mother. He's got a thing for taking blackheads out. And he thinks that I don't know. That he dreams all night of girls who look like Marilyn Monroe. He's even started dancing. Secret dancing. Slower. And as for the rest, they've flown the nest. Got married or moved away. Our oh, Donna Marie's already got three. She's a bit like me that way. Slower. And the other children of mine. I haven't seen for years, although each day I pray he'll be okay, not like Marilyn Monroe. Now what we should have worked out, I mean, Marilyn Monroe, if you know your history, she did die early, you know, so she is kind of constantly referred to as a figure of glamour, but also a figure of tragedy as well. And think about the way that she's been presented there, where well, she's obviously disappointed her children have all left her. Um, so we've got this kind of cycle as well, where even Donna Marie is kind of doing the same things um, that Mrs. Johnson does. So perhaps Russell is suggesting that we can't escape our class. Um, even if we move area, we often f end up falling in the same behavior as those in our family. On the other side of the stage, Mrs. Lyons enters, waltzing with a very awkward 14 year old Edward. Mrs. Lyons speaking, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yes, that's right, you're dancing. That's right, you're dancing. You see, Edward, it's easy. Edward, it is if you have someone to practice with, girls, but in term time we hardly ever see a girl, let alone dance with one. I'll give you some more lessons when you're home for half term. Now, come on, come on, you're going to be late. Daddy's at the door with the car. Now, are you sure you've got all your bags? Yes, they're in the boot. Mrs. Lyons looking at him. I'll see you at half term then, darling. She kisses him a light kiss, but holds on to him. Look after yourself, my love. Oh, mummy, stop fussing. I'm going to be late. We've had a very good time this holiday, though, haven't we? We always do. Yes, we're safe here, aren't we? Mummy, what are you on about? Sometimes a car horn is heard. So think about the juxtaposition, the contrast between the two families and the language they're using. Mummy, uh, the positive language, the gentle language versus the harsh Um more kind of down-to-earth language of Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Lyons, hustling him out good-naturedly. Go on, go on. There's Daddy getting impatient. Bye-bye, Edward. Bye-bye, bye, Ma. Edward exits. So now look at the difference between the two families here. Because we see Mrs. Johnson hustling Mickey to school. Mrs. Johnson, you're going to be late, you know. You're late already. I'm not. You're going to miss the bus? I won't. Well, you'll miss Linda. She'll be waiting for you. Well, I don't want to see her. I don't. What do I want to see her for? Mrs. Johnson laughing at his transparency, meaning like we can see through him. You've already been talking about her in your sleep for the past week. Mickey outraged. You liar. Oh, me sweet darling. I never. That was a line out of a school play. Mrs. Johnson laughing. Her laughter turned into a smile. All right, I believe you. Go on, you'll miss the bus. Are you going? We see Linda at the bus stop. Hiya, Mickey. Mrs. Johnson. Oh, did I forget? Is that why you were waiting for? You're waiting for your mum to give you a big sloppy kiss. Come here. I'm going, I'm going. Sammy runs through the house, pulling on his jacket as he does so. Wait for me, you. Where are you going, Sammy? Sammy on his way out. The dole. Mickey and Sammy exit. So think about the way they're presented there. It's a much more kind of rougher, but more affectionate, isn't it? Think about it. she's giving him a big sloppy kiss. It's more kind of, it's less gentle, but it is kind of very affectionate as well. So we've got, even though the families are from two different backgrounds, very similar ideas in there. Mrs. Johnson stands watching them as they approach the bus stop. She smiles at Mickey, Mickey's failure to cope with Linda's smile of welcome. The bus appears with the narrator as the conductor. Come on, if you're getting on, we've not got all day. Sammy, Mickey and Linda get on the bus. Mrs. J Johnson calling to her kids. Ta-ra, lads, be good, both of you now. I'll cook a nice surprise for your tea. 
conductor noticing her as he goes to ring the bell. Getting on, Mrs. Mrs. Johnson shakes her head, still smiling. Are you happy, are you? Content at last? Wiped out what's happened, forgotten the past. She looks at him, puzzled. But you have an ending. If it starts been made, no one goes without the price being paid. The bus pulls away and the conductor begins to collect fares. No one can embark without the price being paid. So the narrator's always this really dark figure, isn't he? He's always lurking in corners and kind of giving us little omens and little foreshadows and foreboding mo moments. To Mickey, yeah? Mickey, handing over his money. A four-penny scholar? How old are you? He's fourteen. Both of us are. Four-penny scholar for me as well. The conductor gives out tickets as Sammy offers his money. Same for me. No, son. What? You're older than fourteen. Mickey worried. Sammy, shut it to the conductor. I'm fourteen. I want a four-penny scholar. Do you know the penalty for trying to defraud? I'm not defrauding no one. Conductor shouting to the driver. Hey, Billy, take the next left, will you? We've got one for the cop shop here. What? He stands. Oh, he didn't mean it, mister. Don't be soft. He, he was joking. Sammy, tell him. Tell him you're really 16. I'll, I'll lend you the rest of the fare. Sammy considers then. Fuck off. He produces a knife to the conductor. Now move, you. Move. Give me the bag. Mickey. Sammy. Sammy. Sammy to the conductor. I said give. Stop the bus. The conductor rings the bell to stop the bus. Come on, Mickey. You stay where you are, Mickey. You've done nothing. Sammy. Sammy, put that away. It's still not too late. To the conductor. Is it, mister? Mickey. He's staying here. No, Mark. Sammy leaps from the bus and is pursued by the two policemen. The bus pulls away, leaving Mickey and Linda alone on the pavement. You'll get put away for this, you know, Mickey. I know. He's always been a soft get, your Sammy. I know. You better hadn't do anything soft like him. I wouldn't. You better hadn't. I wouldn't be in love with you anymore. Shut up. You're always saying that. I'm not. Yes, you are. You very well said in assembly yesterday. Well, I was only telling you. Yeah, and 500 others as well. I don't care, who knows, I just love you. I love you. Come on, we're half an hour late as it is. Mickey hurries off, followed by Linda. Edward's school, where Edward is confronted by a teacher. The narrator, looking down his nose at Edward. You're doing very well here, aren't you, Lyons? Yes, sir, I believe so. Talking of Oxbridge. Yes, sir. Getting rather big for your boots, aren't you? No, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. I think you're a tight lions. The boys in your dorm say you wear a locket around your neck. Is that so? Pause. Yes, sir. A locket. A locket. This is a boys' school, lions. I am a boy, sir. Then you must behave like one. Now give the locket to me. No, sir. No, sir. Am I to punish you, lions? Am I to have you flogged? You can do exactly as you choose, sir. You can take a flying fuck out of rolling donut. But you shall not take my locket. Teacher thunderstruck. I'm going to. I'm going to have you suspended, lions. Yes, sir. Edward exits. As Edward exits, a class in a secondary modern school is formed. All boredom and futility. Futility meaning like, what's the point? Everyone's kind of feels a bit pointless. The school bell rings. The teacher becomes a teacher of this class, in which we see Linda and Mickey. And so, we know then, don't we, that the Borough Indian of the Amazon Basin lives on a diet of... Sir, sir! A diet of... Sir, sir! A, a, a diet of what? Johnston! The Borough of the Indian Amazon Basin lives on a diet of what? What? Exactly that. Like, what? I don't know. Teacher, his patience gone. You don't know, mimicking. You don't know. I told you two minutes ago, lad. Leave him alone, will you? You just stay out of this, miss. He's got nothing to do with you. It's Johnson, not you. Sir. Oh, shut up, Perkins, you boring little turd. But you don't listen, do you, Johnson? Mickey shrugging. Yeah. Oh, you do. Right. Come on, there. you're in front of the class. Now then, what's the staple diet of the Burrow Indian in the Amazon Basin? Mickey looks about for help. 
There is none. Mickey defiantly. Fish fingers? Just how the hell do you hope to cope when you never listen to anything? It's boring? Yes, yes, you might think it's boring, but you won't be saying that when you can't get a job. Yeah, yeah, it'd really help me get a job if I know what some sodding pygmies in Africa had for their dinner. The class erupts into laughter. Teacher to class, shut up, shut up. Or maybe we're thinking I was looking for a job in an African restaurant. Out. Take no notice of, of Nicky, I love you. Johnson, get out. Oh, leave him alone, you big worm. Right, you as well. Out, out. I'm going, I'm going. You're both suspended. Linda and Mickey leave the class. So look again, we've got the symmetry between Eddie and Mickey there, where they've both had the same experience, haven't they? They've both ridiculed the teacher, both been suspended. But think about the differences in the way that they've done it. Think about the way they've been treated by the teachers. You know, symmetry, but also differences because of class. The classroom sequence breaks up as we see mrs lyons staring at a piece of paper edward is standing before her mrs lyons incredulously and we've had that word before haven't we so we should know what it means so she can't believe it suspended suspended she looks at the paper because of a locket because i wouldn't let him have my locket but what so can i see this locket there's a pause i suppose so if you want to Edward takes off the locket from around his neck and hands it to his mother. She looks at it without opening it. Where did you get this? I can't tell you that. It's a secret. Mrs Lyons finally smiling in relief. I know it's from a girlfriend, isn't it? She laughs. Is there a picture in here? Yes, Mummy. Can I have it back now? You won't let Mummy see your girlfriend. Oh, Edward, don't be so... She playfully moves away. Is she beautiful? Mummy, can... Oh, let me look, let me look. She beams a smile at him, then opens the locket. Music. Mummy, mummy, what's wrong? He goes to her to hold her steady. Mummy! Mrs Lyons takes his arm away from her. What is it? When... When were you photographed with this woman? Pardon? When? Tell me, Edward. Edward begins to laugh. Edward! Mummy, you silly old thing, that's not me, that's Mickey. What? Mickey! You remember my friend when I was little? He takes the locket and shows it to her. Look, that's Mickey and his mother. Why did you think it was me? He looks at it. I never looked a bit like Mickey. Edward replaces the locket around his neck. Mrs Lyons watches him. No, it's just... She stares deep in thought. Edward looking at her. Are you feeling all right, Mummy? You're not ill again like you used to be, are you? Where did you get that locket from, Edward? Why do you wear it? I can't tell you that, Ma. I've explained it's a secret. I can't tell you. But I'm your mother. I know, but I still can't tell you. It's not important. I'm going up to my room. It's just a secret. Everybody has secrets. Don't you have secrets? Edward ent exits to his room. The narrator enters. The music continues. Do you really think you'd become secure? That time had brushed away the past. That there's no one by the window, no one knocking at your door. Did you believe you were free at last, free from the broken looking glass? Or do you know the devil's got your number? So you might remember last lesson, we ended kind of halfway through, but it was the narrator who keeps popping up and giving us these little, these little mischievous, this narrator, isn't he? He comes in and he just reminds us of the death he's you know we're just getting into it we're enjoying it maybe it's funny and then we get the narrator going oh by the way they're going to die um and he brings in the superstitious element so we've got caught him halfway through a song here so we'll um kind of meet him where he left off he's never far behind you and he knows where to find you and some said they'll see him walking past your door narrator exits we see mickey and linda making their way up the hill Linda having some difficulty in high-heeled shoes. So think about that now. She's trying to walk in high-heeled shoes. High -heeled shoes. What does that suggest about her character? Remember, she was really good with the gun, wasn't she? Far better than the lads. Now she's trying to fit into her stereotype. She's trying to, to be what she thinks she should be. And it's not really working, is it? So think about that and how women are presented when we think about class as well and we think about inequality. Linda. Tch. You didn't tell me it was going to be over a load of fields. I didn't tell you nothing. I didn't ask you to come. You followed me. 
He walks away from her. Linda watching him walk away. Mickey, Mickey, I'm stuck. Holding out her helpless arms. Me foot stuck, honest. Mickey goes back timidly, takes a wrist and ineffectually pulls. Mickey, I think you might be more successful if you were to sort of put your arms around me here. She puts her hands on her waist. Oh, Mickey, be gentle, be gentle. Mickey, managing to pull her free. Will you stop taking a piss out of me? I'm not, I'm not. Mickey points down the direction they've come from. Look, you can see the estate from up here. Have we come all this way just to look at the bleeding estate? Mickey, we're 14. She beams at him. He can't take it and he looks the other way. Look, what? There's that lad looking out the window. I see him sometimes when I'm up here. Oh, him, he's gorgeous, isn't he? What? He's lovely looking, isn't he? All right, all right, you told me once. Well, he is. What, do you care if I think another fella's gorgeous, eh? I don't. You, I give up with you, Mickey Johnston. I'm off. You got on my bleeding nerves. Linda exit. Wait, Linda, Linda, don't, Linda, I, I want to kiss you and put my arms around you and kiss you and kiss you and even fornicate with you. But I don't know how to tell you because I got pimples and my feet are too big and my bum sticks out and he becomes conscious of Edward approaching and affects nonchalance. Nonchalance means like not bothered, like he's just kind of hanging out there. If I was him, I'd know singing all the right words. If I was like him, I'd know some real birds, apart from those in my dreams and in magazines. Just look at his hair. His hair's dark and wavy, mine's mouse, mousy, too fair. Mine's the colour of gravy. Each part of his face in just the right place. He laughs at me, holding my nose. Did he notice? I should wear a brace. That I've got hailstorsis. When the nature's picked on me, she chose to stick on me. Eyes that don't match, ears that stand out. She's picked the wrong batch when she hands mine out. And then she's attacked me with permanent acne. I wish I was bit like, wish that I could score a hit like. I just want to be a bit like that guy, that guy. I wish I could be like just a little less me, like the sort of guy I see, that guy, that guy. Hi. Hi, give a Siggy. Now think about the, the symmetry here. And we've, when they first met each other, these two characters, Giz a sweet. Now it's Giz a Siggy. So think about how they've changed from sweet characters to corrupted characters, because sweets obviously represent sweetness, and cigarettes represent corruption, what it does to you from the inside out, so they've been corrupted. Oh, I don't smoke actually, but I can go and get. I can get you some. Are you soft? He suddenly realizes. A blood brother? Mickey? Well, shag the vicar. Mickey laughs. What's wrong? You. You sound dead funny swearing in that posh voice. What posh voice? That one. Well, where do you live? The estate. Look. He points. My God, I only live. I know. That girl I saw you with. Was that Linda? Do you remember Linda? Wow. Was that Linda? And is she your girlfriend? Yeah, she's one of them. One of them. Have you got a girlfriend? Me? Me? No. Haven't you? Look, you seem to have rather a lot of them. Um, perhaps you should share one with me. Share one, Eddie? I haven't even got one girlfriend. But, Linda, you said... I know, but she's not. I mean, I mean, she would be me girlfriend. She even says she loves me all over the place, but it just finds it just, like, dead difficult. What? Like, knowing what to say? But you must, you must... I know that. But every time I see her, I promise myself, I'll ask her, but the words just disappear. But you mustn't let them. What do I say, though? Mickey, it's easy. I've read about it. Look, the next time you see Linda, you stare straight into her eyes and you say, Linda, I love you. I want you. The very core of my being is longing for you. My loins are burning for you. Let me lay my weary head between your warm breasts. And then, Mickey, her eyes will be full, will be half closed, and her voice may appear somewhat husky as she pleads with you, be gentle with me, be gentle. It would work, you know. Listen, we can see how it's done. Look at the Esvaldo for one week only. Nymphomaniac knights and Swedish au pairs. Whoa. I'll have to go home and get some money. As the boys are going, we see Mrs. Lyons appear. She has seen Edward and Mickey, and she stares after them. Making up her mind, she quickly goes and fetches a coat then follows the two boys. 
the narrator enters music. Now notice how these two brothers, as soon as they've met each other, it's like they haven't been apart. They're straight into talking and they're helping each other out. So we've got that, that connection, haven't we? No one understands them. No one gets where they're coming from, like we looked at in the starter task, but they understand each other. Edward, I've got plenty. I'll lend. No, it's all right. Me mum will give it me. Come on then, before my ma sees me. She's off. She's off a beam, my ma. The boys exit, followed by Mrs. Lyons. Narrator seeing. Did you really think you'd come, become secure? And that the past was tightly locked away? Did you really feel you'd never be found? Did you forget you've got some debts to pay? Did you forget about the reckoning day? Yes, the devil. He's still got your number. He's moved in down the street from you. Someone said he wants to speak to you. Someone said they'd seen him leaning on your door. The narrator exits. We see Mrs. Johnson in the her kitchen as Mickey bursts in, followed by Edward. Mother, ma'am, look, it's Eddie, Eddie. Mrs. Johnson stands looking at Edward and smiling. Hiya, Mrs. Johnson. Isn't it fantastic? We're neighbours again. Mum, 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 Eddie lives in that house, you know, that big house over the hill. Mum, can you lend us a quid to go to the pictures? Yes, it's, um, it's in the sideboard. Oh, thanks, ma'am, I love you. Mickey exits the next room. You're looking very well, Mrs. Johnson. Am I? Do you, do you still keep that locket I gave you? Of course, look. Mickey enters. Ma'am, ma'am, can I bring Eddie backwards, a afterwards, for a coffee? Yeah, go on. Go and enjoy yourselves, but don't be too late, will you? See you, ma'am. Bye, Mrs. Johnson. The boys prepare to leave. So think again about the locket. You know, the, the narrator just saying about things being locked away and the fact that he keeps that locked picture of them. So we've got that, that symbol all the way through of, of secrecy and isolation. Maybe again, how the boys feel locked away and trapped. Mrs. Johnson. Hey, what film are you going to see? Um, what? What film? Uh, Dr. Zhivago, Magnificent Seven. Dr. Zhivago's Magnificent Seven? It's a double bill. I see. And where's it on? What? The Isoldo. Oh, oh, the Isoldo, eh? When I passed the Isoldo this morning, they were showing Nymphomaniac Knights and Swedish Au Pairs. Ah, oh, yes, Mrs. Johnson, yes, yes, they've, that, that, they're just the trailers. A documentary and... and and a travelogue about Sweden. Do the pair of you really think I was born yesterday? Edward can't hold it any longer and breaks into embarrassed laughter. Mickey trying to hold on. It is, it is, it's just a travelogue. Showing the spectacular bends and curves of Sweden. Go on, you randy little sods. Mickey scandalised. Mother, go on before I thrust a bucket of walker over your pair of you. Mickey drags Edward out. I don't know about coffee. You'd be better off with bromide. She gets on with her walk, with her work. Edward outside the house, but looking back. She's fabulous, your ma, isn't she? She's a fucking head case, come on. And they run off. We see Mrs. Lyons appear from where she's been concealed in the alley. Again, that word concealed and the alley. Alley's representing claustrophobia, isolation, feeling all trapped. So again, that's how she's feeling inside. Mrs. Johnson is lilting the we go dancing line as Mrs. Lyons appears in the kitchen. Mrs. Johnson gets a shock as she looks up and sees Mrs. Lyons there. The two women stare at each other. Mrs. Johnson eventually nodding. Hello. How long have you lived here? Pause. A few years. Pause. Are you always going to follow me? We were rehoused here. I didn't follow. Don't lie. I know what you're doing. You're, you gave him that locket, didn't you, hmm? Mrs. Johnson nods. He never takes it off, you know. You're very clever, aren't you? I, I thought I'd never see him again. I wanted him to have a picture of me, even though he'd never know. Afraid he might eventually have forgotten you? Oh, no, there's no chance of that. He's always remembered you. After we moved, he talked less and less of you and your family. I started, just for a while, I came to believe he was actually mine. He is yours. No, I took him, but I never made him mine. Does he know? Have you told? Of course not. Even when, when he was a tiny baby, I'd see him looking straight at me, and I'd think, he knows. He knows. You've ruined me. But you won't ruin Edward. Is it money you want? What? I'll get it for you. If you move away from here, how much? 
Look, how much? Nothing, nothing. You bought me off once before. Thousands. I'm talking about thousands if you want it. And think what you could do with money like that. I'd spend it. I'd buy more junk and trash, that's all. I don't want your money. I've made a life out here. It's not much of one, maybe, but I made it. I'm staying, I'm staying here. If you move, if you want to. I would, but there's no point. You'd just follow me again, wouldn't you? Look, I'm not following anybody. Wherever I go, you'll be just behind me. I know that now. Always and forever and ever, like, like a shadow, unless I can make you go. But you won't, so we see that throughout the above, Mrs. Lyons has opened the knife drawer and has a lethal-looking kitchen knife in her hand. Mrs. Johnson, unaware, has her back to her. On impulse and punctuated by a note, Mrs. Johnson wheels. On a punctuated note, Mrs. Johnson lunges. Mrs. Johnson moves and avoids it. Mrs. Lyons lunges again, but Mrs. Johnson managed to get hold of the wrist, rendering the knife hand helpless. Mrs. Johnson takes the knife from Mrs. Lyons, grasps and moves away. So we've had this altercation here with a knife. Again, what we should be reminded of is Sammy on the bus. You know, Sammy had the knife on the bus. Now we've got Mrs. Lyons, both from very different backgrounds. Um, but maybe we would expect Sammy to have a knife because he's young, because he's male, because he's from a working class background. And perhaps we wouldn't expect Mrs. Johnson. And maybe that's Willie Russell saying we're not all that different. Um, and trying to defy our expectations as well and our stereotypes. Mrs. Johnson staring at her knowing, you're mad, you're mad. Mrs. Johnson quietly, I cursed the day I met you. You ruined me. Go, just go. Witch, suddenly pointing, I curse you, witch. Mrs. Johnson screaming, go. Mrs. Lyons exits to the street. Kids' voices are heard chanting off. High up on the hill, the mad woman lives. Never ever eat the sweets she gives. Just throw them away and tell your dad. High up on a hill, there's a woman gone mad. Mad woman, mad woman, living on a hill. She catches your eye, then you never will. Grow any further, your teeth will go bad. High up on the hill, there's a woman gone mad. Eddie and Mickey emerge from the cinema, blinking as they try to adjust to the glare of the light in the streets. They're both quite overcome with their celluloid erotic encounter. As they pause and light up cigarettes by a corner lamppost, they groan in their ecstatic agony. Each is in an aroused entrance. Ooh, naked knockers, ooh, naked knockers with nipples. Playing tennis, tennis with tits. Will Wimbledon ever be the same? Tits, 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 tits. He begins a frustrated chant of the word, oblivious to everything. Linda and a mate enter. Finally, Mickey realises Linda's presence and knocks Edward, who becomes aware of the girl's presence. He goes into a song without missing a beat. Tits, tits, and tits a lovely way to spend an evening. Edward grabs Linda's mate and begins to waltz around the street. Can't think of anything I'd rather do. Mate, simultaneously with the above. Get off, put me down. Get your friggin' paws off me. Linda, you bloody lunatic, get off. Edward finally releases her and bows. Linda, come on, I'm going. The mate begins to walk away. Linda makes no attempt to follow. What are you doing in town, Mick? We've, um, we've, we've had been undergoing a remarkable celluloid experience. We'll miss the bus, Linda. We've been to the pictures. So have we. What'd you go and see? So you might remember last um, time we read, um, it was a section where Edward and Mickey had gone to the cinema. They'd seen a film they shouldn't have seen. And now we're finding out about Linda and how she may have already seen these films as well. So Edward, Nympho, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai. Ah, oh, yeah, we've seen that. We went to see Nymphomaniac Nights instead and Swedish au pairs. You what? Edward begins to laugh. So again, look at Linda and how she's characterised. She's never the innocent flower, is she? She's always somebody who's um, quite experienced. She's quite um, knowledgeable. Uh, she's very skillful. She doesn't really fit when she's trying to fit in uh, to be a stereotypical girl when she's wearing the high heels. And she's much better at shooting a, a gun um, or being more of a tomboy. Edward begins to laugh. Oh, sod you then, I'm going. The mate exits. Mickey to Edward. What are you laughing at? Take no notice. 
Remember, Eddie, he's still a nutcase. Shut up! Eddie shouted, shouting, tits, 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 tits. Edward leaps around and hopefully ends up sitting at the top of the lamppost. Linda and Mickey laugh at him while Edward chants. A policeman enters. The three do not see the arrival of the policeman. And what the bloody hell do you think you're doing? Adolf Hitler? Get down. Edward gets down from the lamppost. Policeman getting out his black book. Right, I want your names. What's your name? Linda, Mickey and Edward together. Waiting for the 92 bus. Linda pointing upwards. Oh my God, look. Now listen. The policeman falls for it and looks up. The three make their exit. The policeman realises and gives a chase. Mickey, Linda and Edward enter laughing and exhausted. The narrator enters. There's a few bob in your pocket and you've got good friends. And it seems that the summer's never coming to an end. Young, free and innocent. You haven't got a care. Apart from deciding on the clothes you're going to wear. The streets turned into paradise. The radios singing dreams. You're innocent, immortal. You're just 15. To think about the way the narrator is setting them up there, talking about them being immortal and innocent. And of course we know that this is going to end tragically. And so again, it's creating that contrast for us. And it's creating tension because the more he mentions that they're immortal and innocent, the more we know, well, they're not. So the narrator becomes the rifle range man at the fairground. Linda, Mickey and Edward rush on. Linda, Mickey and Edward pull their money and hand it to the rifle range man. He gives the gun to Mickey, who smiles, shakes his head and points to Linda. The man offers the gun to Edward, but Linda takes it. The boys indicate to the rifle range man that he has it, had it now and Linda has the gun. They eagerly watch the target, but their smiles fade as Linda misses all three shots. Mickey and Edward turn on Linda in mock anger. They are stopped by the rifle range man throwing them a coconut, which is used as a ball for a game of piggy in the middle. When Linda is caught in the middle, the game freezes. And who dare tell the lambs in spring what fate the later seasons bring? Who tell the girl in the middle of the pair the price she'll pay for just being there? So again, there's that sense of foreboding, that ominous feeling that even though we're watching something innocent and lovely, something bad is going to happen. And we've got that reference to the lambs in spring. And of course, lambs ultimately go to the slaughter. So we've got the imagery of innocence and also the imagery of slaughter. Throughout the following, we see Linda, Mickey and Edward suiting their action to the words coming out of the chip shop, taking, talking, lighting a cigarette by the lamppost. But leave them alone, let them go and play. They care not for what's at the end of the day, for what is to come, for what might have been. Life has no ending when you're sweet 16 and your friends are with you to talk away the night or until Mrs. Wong switches off the chippy light. Then there's always the corner and the street lamps glare another hour to spend with your friends with her to share your last cigarette and your secret dream at the midnight hour at 17. and look at the the language that's used it's very kind of nursery rhyme isn't it but leave them alone let them go and play that's meant to remind us of leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind her so we got that again the imagery of lambs with uh, little bo peepers lost her sheep so we've got that sense of being lost, like lost little lambs, lambs to the slaughter, and innocence with the nursery rhyme. So Willie Russell's very clever here, isn't he? Throughout the following, we see Linda, Mickey, and Edward, as if at the beach. Linda, taking a picture of Mickey and Edward, arms around each other, camping it for the camera, but eventually giving good and open smiles. Mickey taking a picture of Edward and Linda, Edward down on one knee and kissing her hand, Edward taking a picture of Mickey and Linda, Mickey pulling a distorted face, Linda wagging a finger at him, Mickey chastened, Linda raising her eyebrows and putting one of his arms around her, Linda moving forward and taking the camera, Linda waving the narrator to snap them, he goes, Linda shows the narrator how to operate the camera. Linda, Mickey and Edward group together, arms around each other as the narrator takes the picture. They get the camera and wave their thanks to the narrator. It's just another ferry boat, a trip to the beach. But everything is possible, the world's within your reach, and you don't even notice the broken bottles in the sand, the oil in the water, and you can't understand how living could be anything other than a dream when you're young, free and innocent, and just 18.
So again, we've seen them growing up there. They've gone from 14 to 16 to 18, notice in the space of a, uh, a few minutes. But we've got that imagery of being corrupted. We've got the oil in the water, the broken bottles in the sand. So we've got things there um, that perhaps once were valuable like bottles, oil, are now becoming something corrupted. So we're getting that imagery of corruption. We know something bad's gonna happen. Of course, we know that right from the beginning with the prologue. Linda, Mickey and Edward exit. And only if the three of them could stay like that forever. And only if we could predict no changes in the weather. And only if we didn't live in life as well as dreams. And only if we could stop and be forever just 18. We see Edward waiting by a street lamp. Linda approaches, sees him and goes into a street walk. Well, hello, sweetie pie. Looking for a good time? Ten to seven? She laughs. Good time? Ten to seven? It was a joke. I mean, I know it was a lousy joke, but you could at least go into hysterics. Edward smiles. That's hysterics. Where's Mickey? He must be working overtime. Oh. What's wrong with you, Misery? Edward, after a pause. I go away to university tomorrow. Tomorrow? You didn't say. I know. I think I've been pretending that if I didn't mention it, the day would never come. I love it when we're together, the three of us, don't you? Linda nods. Can I write to you? Yeah. Yeah, if you want. Would Mickey mind? Why should he? Oh, come on, because you're his girlfriend. No, I'm not. You are, Linda. I'm not. He hasn't asked me. Edward laughing. You mean he still hasn't? La Linda laughing. No, but it's ridiculous. I know. I hope for his sake he never has to ask me to marry him. He'll be a pensioner before he gets round to it. Edward, after a pause. He's mad. If I was Mickey, I would have asked you years ago. I know you would, because you're soft, you are. Edward singing. If I could stand inside his shoes, I'd say how I'd compare thee to a summer's day. Linda speaking. Oh, go away. Now, look, he's mentioned references here. Could I compare thee to a summer's day? He's using Shakespearean references. So showing off his education to Linda. The things that, of course, Mickey can't do. I'd take a page in all the papers. I'd announce it on the news. If I was the guy, I was in his shoes. I would, was him, I'd bring you flowers and ask you to dance. We'd while away the hours making future plans for rainy days in country lanes and trips to the sea. I'd just tell you that I love you if it was me. But I'm not saying a word. I'm not saying I care. Though I would like you to know that I'm not saying a word. I'm not saying I care. Though I would like you to know. If I was him, I'd have to tell you what I've kept in my heart. Even if we had to live some worlds apart, there would be not a day in which I would not think of you. If I was him, if I was him, that's what I'd do. But I'm not saying a word. I'm not saying I care, though I would like you to know that I'm not saying a word. I'm not saying I care, though I would like you to know. So we've now got a sense that uh, obviously both boys, like Linda, seem to be in love with Linda. So we're starting to have clues as to what's going to happen as we go forward or what happened from the prologue. But I'm not. What? Mickey. Mickey enters. Mickey! Ah, yeah, Ed, Lind. Where have you been? I had to do overtime. I hate that sodding place. Mickey, I'm going away tomorrow. To university. What? You didn't say. I know. But the thing is, I won't be back until Christmas. Three months. Now, you wouldn't want me to continue in suspense all that time, would you? What are you on about? Will you talk to Linda? Oh, Eddie. Go on. Go on. Mickey turns and goes to her. Linda tries to keep a straight face. Um, well, uh, the thing is, Linda, I've, um, quickly. Linda, for Christ's sake, will you go out with me? Linda, just as quickly. Yeah. Oh, um, good. Well, I suppose I'd better, well, uh, come here. He quickly embraces and kisses Linda. Linda fighting for air. My God, you take your time going, but then there's no stopping you. I know, come here. They kiss again. Edward turns and begins to leave. Eddie, Eddie, where you going? Thought we were all going to the club. There's a dance. No, I've got to um, pack for tomorrow. Are you sure? Edward nods. See you at Christmas then, Eddie. Listen, I'm going to do loads of overtime before now and then, so the Christmas party's going to be on me, right? Right, it's a deal, Mick. See you. Linda rushes across and kisses Edward lightly. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah, Eddie, thanks. Linda and Mickey, arms around each other, watch him go. They turn and look at each other. Mickey and Linda exit. The lights crossfade to the Johnston house. Mickey enters and prepares to go to work. 
Mrs. Johnson enters with Mickey's lunch bag. The narrator enters. It was one day in October when the sun began to fade, and winter broke the promise that summer had just made. It was on one day in October when the rains came falling down, and someone said the bogeyman was seen around the town. So we get reference again to that bogeyman that had right at the beginning, and we've got that pathetic fallacy, the dark weather, predicting to us what's going to happen next. The narrator exits. Mrs. Johnston. You're going to be late, Mick. I don't want you getting the sack and spending your days idling round like our Sammy. Come on. Mickey, instead of making an effort to go, stands looking at her. Ma'am. What? What? Come on. Ma'am, Linda's pregnant. A moment. Do you love her? Yeah. When's the wedding? We thought about a month before Christmas anyway. Ma'am, could we live here for a bit? She looks at him and nods. Are you mad? Are you? Some hypocrite I'd be. No, I'm not mad, son. I'm just thinking. You've not had much of a life with me, have you? Don't be stupid. Of course I have. You're great, you are, ma'am. Gives her a quick kiss. Tara, I'd better get a move on. They started laying people off in the factory, you know. Tara, ma'am. Thanks. Mickey exits. Music. Mrs. Johnson watches him go. As Mrs. Jones begins, she whips off her overall and a wedding suit is underneath. She acquires a hat. A wedding party assembles. Mickey remains in his working clothes. Linda is in white. Other guests are suitably attired. A managing director enters and sings as his secretary. Miss Jones takes notes. Mr. Lyons singing. Take a letter, Miss Jones. Quote, I regret to inform you that owing to circumstances quite beyond our control, it's a premature requirement for those surplus to requirement. I'm afraid it's a sign of the times, Miss Jones, an unfortunate sign of the times. Throughout the next verse, we see the wedding party wave goodbye to Mickey, who goes to work only to have his cards given to him when he gets there. Uh, take a letter, Miss Jones. Due to the world situation, the shrinking pound, the global slump, the price of oil, I'm afraid we must fire you. We no longer require you. It's just another sign of the times, Miss Jones, most miserable sign of the times. The guests at the wedding become a line of men looking for work. Mickey joins them as Linda watches. They are constantly met with shaking heads, and by the end of the following verse have assembled in the dole office. Take a letter, Miss Jones. Of course we'll let the workforce know when inflation's been defeated and the recession is no more, and for the moment we suggest you don't become too depressed, as it's only a sign of the times, Miss Jones, a peculiar sound of the times. Take a letter, Miss Jones, my dear Miss Jones. We'd like to thank you many years of splendid service, etc., blah, blah, blah. You've been a perfect puppet. Yes, that's right, Miss Jones, you've got it. It's another sign of the times, Miss Jones. It's just another sign of the times. So look at the repetition. Obviously, it's a song, and we've got like a verse going, but it's that sense of repetition that this is happening to everybody. All of them are being laid off work, and it means really nothing to this man. It's a song he's singing. It's just part of his life. For him, it doesn't matter. He's the boss. But for these people, it's obviously their livelihoods, and it links to this theme of poverty. He shows her the door, crying she approaches the doll queue, but then hesitates. The men in the queue take up the song. Dry your eyes, Miss Jones. It's not as bad as it seems. You get used to being idle in a year or two. Unemployment's such a pleasure. These days we call it leisure. It's just another sign of the times, Miss Jones. Just another sign of the times. Mickey leaves the group and stands apart. Miss Jones takes his place. Behind Mickey, we can see Linda and his mother. There's a young man on the street, Miss Jones. He's walking around in circles. He's old before his time, but still too young to know. Don't look at him. Don't cry, though. This living in the guy row. It's only a sign of the times, Miss Jones. It's just another sign of the times. As they exit, Miss Jones, it's just another sign of the times. Crowd exits. Mickey is left alone, sitting, dejected. We hear Christmas bells. Edward enters in a duffel coat and a college scarf. Unseen by Mickey, Edward creeps up behind Mickey and puts his hand over his eyes. <laughs> 